Being critical of capitalism is a bit of an easy sell. There is, of course, no economic principle protected from the slimy hands of opportunistic cronies, but capitalism in particular seems to attract a great deal of criticism and distaste, notably from young people. And at the core of that distaste is a refusal to accept the premises of capitalism at all. The premises of an open market, of an equal playing field, of a great chain that pulls in the direction that the people demand it goes. There is no equal playing field. We know there are inequalities and injustices. We know there are forces at work that prevent people from having the same opportunities as others. We know these premises to be idealistic, to be of varying degrees of truthfulness. And no matter how many Ayn Rand books Paul Ryan may sleep with at night, even he must know that the great experiment of capitalism hasn't been perfected yet. And you see, that's the thing. If you don't accept the premises of an argument, you are incapable of accepting the conclusions as fact. And that's what makes capitalism an e easy target for criticism, especially from young people. A lot of it is justified. It doesn't look great. It certainly doesn't look perfect. But is it preferable? As a franchise, Borderlands knows that it's an absurd ride through Violence Central. It is a self-referential, cynical tale about our misconceptions of heroism and our abuse of capitalism. But Borderlands is also a moral tale that is told in a brazen, amoral way. So analyzing a game like Borderlands is, in a sense, playing with fire? It's a futile effort. This is to say that I get the idea that Borderlands relishes in its abrasiveness, that if it were an anthropomorphized being that it would laugh in the face of those who try to psychoanalyze it. Borderlands is a series that satirizes its own place and culture, its own genre, and at times itself. How could we possibly engage in any sort of meaningful analysis of a game that finds itself making poop jokes in between shotgun decapitations? And even with this being said, the franchise deserves recognition for what it's accomplished in terms of story, character, and theme. In a genre defined by gameplay, skill points, and numbers, Borderlands marries these components with that which you might find in a more, I don't know, atmospheric, linear, story-driven game. There's a tremendous amount of humanity written into the Borderlands series, and when compared to its genre counterparts, it is absolutely the exception to the rule. And let me quickly expand upon this. Borderlands is an action role-playing game, a genre defined by numbers, percentages, and experience points. And when we consider the games that occupy this space, your Diablos, Destinies, maybe even Dark Souls to a degree, we find that the pull is the gameplay. It is the numbers, the constant dopamine release of finding new loot, of making that number bigger. And rest assured, Borderlands has all of that. Maybe even it is the priority. What Borderlands has, though, that those games don't is a cast of unique, cliche-defeating characters interacting with each other in meaningful ways. Look. In Diablo or Destiny, you are going to have different classes of characters, right? Same thing in Borderlands. You may play a character that specializes in health regeneration, or one that is intended to hit and run certain types of elemental damage. Now this is the same for all of these games. What is not the same, however, is the character themselves. This is to say that the Warlock, Titan, and Hunter all act the same, despite their strictly gameplay difference. They are all the same, Vapid Vessel. In Borderlands, the classes are the characters, and they are further characterized in the sequels. Of course, the most spectacular and memorable characters in these titles aren't even the characters. There are about 87 bazillion protagonists in this game, and they all carry more character and story than a lot of shooters' real corporeal human characters. Borderlands' weapons are the real show here, and the marketing knows it. Borderlands is branded as a game with the most amount of weapons, and while that is technically true, it's far from true once you understand what is going on, which we'll delve into. And as a piece of software, Borderlands is an outstanding title when compared to its genre counterparts. As a value proposition, Borderlands is an incredible amount of content. This is no exaggeration. The content proposition available to you is tier one in terms of video games. In the event that you like the games, and in the event of a Steam sale, you could get three video games with seven playthroughs each, nine full expansion packs, and hours upon hours of content. I imagine one could get all of this for under $30. It is an extraordinary amount of video game. Couple this with the fact that the game is built around replayability, that strength comes in its unpredictability, then one begins to see just how incredible Borderlands is as pure value for one's money. As a piece of storytelling, Borderlands both succeeds and fails. 
It is certainly tremendous for its genre, but maybe not so in terms of first-person shooters, and certainly not so in terms of role-playing games. And while I believe that, strictly narrative-wise, the series improves with each entry, it is still a game that requires a great deal of trust on the player's part. Borderlands, as a franchise, is a bit of a divisive series of games. It's an identifiable game, a series subjected to enough Steam sales and Humble Bundles that to have missed it is to have purposefully missed it. To be a PC gamer in particular, and to have not played any of Gearbox's cell shaded looter shooters, is to have at some point, most likely, been given an opportunity to play and chosen not to. Speaking purely anecdotally and without any evidence at all, I've found that Borderlands turns people off just as quickly as it may interest some people in the game. I am unsure why this may be the case. I would even think that some may be disappointed that I chose this franchise as one that I would do an analysis over. My guess is the art style and the humor, both of which we'll delve into. It goes without saying that this analysis is full of spoilers, appearing maybe when you least expect it. As we explore this franchise, we're going to find that there's a lot more than one would think to unpack. We're going to find that not everyone believes in this genre hybrid. For some, we may find out whether or not you believe that this game has anything to say at all. Personally, I believe it does. Personally, I think the creative directors over at Gearbox Software, they took a risk, and I think they knew what they were doing, most of the time. Borderlands 1 has sold well over 8 million copies, and according to Gearbox, Borderlands 2 has sold well over 12 million copies, which is a whole lot. To put that into perspective, certain games like Bioshock haven't even reached that mark. Add on to the numbers of a less successful pre-sequel, and then a potentially entirely new audience in Telltale's Tales from the Borderlands, and Borderlands has, not so quietly, become one of the most successful franchises in the world, launching Gearbox into the privileged position of being able to create new IPs and even be a publisher of games. Borderlands' cell-shaded aesthetic has extraordinarily shaped the public's consciousness towards the franchise. Randy Pitchford, CEO of Gearbox, has been seen tweeting that the game's art style has actually done more harm than good. In an interview with IGN's executive editor, Ryan McCaffrey, he actually spoke saying that, I knew it was putting a ceiling on us because there's, especially back then, there's just a huge percentage of the gaming audience that does not want a cartoon. And can you blame his apprehension? I'm unsure. I'm not sure that I would have seen any sort of reason to pick up another first-person shooter were it not for its unique aesthetic. I'm confident that there is neither a push nor a pull against such aesthetics. I mean, Fortnite kind of shows that. I'm confident that there are many holes to be homes to be occupied in the video game industry. The RPG home is filled to the brim, rivaled only by the first-person shooter home. Inside the cel-shaded looter shooter, first-person RPG house resides three. Borderlands, Borderlands 2, and Borderlands the pre-sequel. In the annex resides Tales from the Borderlands, Lonely, but Family. And if you're new to this channel, then hello, I'm David. I study and teach English as a job and write pretentious video game analysis as it says as a hobby. In the spirit of full disclosure, Borderlands holds a unique place in my heart, and that's specifically Borderlands 2. In 2012, I don't think I had ever been more depressed. I fought panic attacks and depression my whole life, and it was finally coming to a head. I rig rigged this miniature TV to be able to sit on my bed so I could play Borderlands 2 from a horizontal position. I couldn't get out of bed. And I think a lot of us have had this experience with video games. Mine was Borderlands 2. It just came at the right time. It helped me get involved with the community. It gave me achievable goals at the time when I was unable to work towards anything. It made me laugh, make friends, and above all, above any other important thing the video games have ever done for me, above this channel reaching 100 million subscribers, this video game connected me to my girlfriend Alethea. Sure, I probably would have connected with my significant other anyway, but for a while, Borderlands was the vehicle for which I fell in love with her. Our cooperative experiences on Pandora helped pull me out of loneliness, and her acceptance and genuine interest in a dumb game showed me that she was willing to learn for me. And cringe be damned, Borderlands helped establish the most important thing to me. I say all this because my entire YouTube channel, this entire hobby, is designed to find that humanity in games. And sure, I want to look at games as pieces of text, of rhetoric, of art, but none of that is as important to me as finding out why games are important to us as humans. And I know that the length of this video seems daunting, and I know that you'll probably not watch all of this in one take. There are timestamps in the description separating each game in the franchise. You must understand that just skipping to the Borderlands 2 analysis is gimping yourself of a great deal of relevant analysis. 
This is not just four different analysis videos compiled into one video. Everything I talk about in the Borderlands part of the analysis is relevant to that which I speak about in the Borderlands 2 part of the analysis. This analysis intends to discover what the Borderlands franchise is trying to say as pieces of rhetoric, and how they act and matter as a piece of video game software, which is to say, where do they succeed and fail in terms of gameplay and graphical fidelity? Join me, and let's head towards Pandora for the first time. At the core of the Borderlands experience, I think, is a never-ending drive towards something new. Sort of like capitalism. Something better. The first Borderlands game is a title that relies on this fact, that establishes it as a goal early on. Our loved and hated capitalist Marcus narrates the context for the entire game here in the first couple of minutes. It's an info dump, sure, but it's a thematically consistent info dump. He speaks of the Vault, a once-generation stash of insurmountable loot and wealth. It is, without question, the reason why people live on Pandora. Marcus not only carts you to your destination, but also encourages you to seek out this vault. Because let me tell you, there sure as hell isn't another reason to take residence here. It's a zoo for the most intense and threatening wildlife known to man. Its dust-colored ground is only comparable in color to its dust-colored rock formations. Alarmingly, the weather seems nice. Marcus crucially mythologizes the vault and those who hunt it. It is not a fact. It is legend. A golden city unfound by human eyes. The vault is a concept passed down, generation to generation, its meaning and reality skewed by the spoken highways of time. Its lack of specificity is key to its allure, to its mythology. The contents of the vault are limited only to the imagination of the storyteller. And Marcus is important because he represents the people of Pandora and what is to be expected. He's self-motivated, greedy, violent, and amoral. So you play as one of four characters named Vault Hunters who are occupying a bus headed towards Firestone. You are on this hellhole of a planet called Pandora because of the vault. You can then see why the term Vault Hunter may seem to the residents of Pandora closer to Conquistador than it is Pirate, depending on who you ask. And let's talk about that name, Vault Hunter. It changes the core of what you're doing, doesn't it? It's almost a bit of Orwellian doublespeak. It makes what the player is doing seem somewhat heroic, as if their identity demands such action. It's the same reason we might call an assassination an extrajudicial killing, or an unprovoked attack a preemptive assault. Calling someone a vault hunter is a bit more digestible than calling someone, at best, an opportunistic mercenary, and at worst, an imperialistic slaughtering misanthropist. Vault hunter sure does sound better. In Borderlands, bandits will never shy away from an opportunity to call you a mercenary. In New Haven and Sanctuary in the second title, citizens will look upon you and say, Oh wow, a vault hunter! As if you are anything different from those who traveled overseas to take something that isn't theirs. The series is constantly asking you to consider perspective here, and consider heroics. Unfortunately, we have to table that conversation until the second game. So you sit in a bus with a cool sort of more diegetic character select screen, which by the way, and because I will forget, I really prefer this to the character select screen in Borderlands 2. The one in BL2 seems so rushed and underdeveloped. This one feels seamless. Okay, digression. Mordecai is a sniper. His skills focus on critical hits and lethality, as well as crucially ignoring shields. This is so overpowered later. Lilith is a siren, and trust me, we will be talking more about the sirens, and she focuses on lightweight movement with SMGs and elemental damage. Roland is a commando, focusing on consistent damage, suppression, and healing. And finally, Brick, who a majority of the gameplay will be coming from, is the tank, if those are even supposed to exist in the Borderlands games. Brick is focused on explosive damage, health regen, and melee. I feel it necessary to start our analysis with a little bit of context about the world. The game takes place in the future, but there's a healthy amount of anachronistic elements that may confuse you of the time and place of Borderlands story. It is the year 2864, and the Atlas Corporation, a hugely successful mega company, joined by mining cities, yes, cities, and colonization ships head towards the planet of Pandora in order to capitalize on a supposedly valuable mineral on the planet. Miners flock to Pandora in the same way they did to California in 1849, in droves. The desire for striking it rich empowers many to give up their lives and just try. It's the thematic bedrock to the rest of the entire game. You yourself are no different than these miners. If there is something valuable out there in the world, you must go and get it for yourself. The Atlas Corporation didn't realize that Pandora was in its winter cycle and found nothing. 
Spring rolls around, and the horrific beings of Pandora come out of hiding and begin to wreak havoc on the miners. Realizing this, Atlas leaves the planet immediately. And enticed by the same rumors of value on the planet, as well as the mythology of the Vault, another mega corporation comes to Pandora. The Doll Corporation brings a huge amount of convict workers, as well as a galaxy renowned archaeologist, Patricia Tannis. Doll leaves after not finding the Vault. Crucially, however, they leave the criminals and miners on the planet that they no longer have any use for. Whether it was the harsh world of Pandora or a byproduct of the elements hidden in the planet, these miners go crazy and become bandits, creating their own world on Pandora, and, as we mentioned, mythologizing the vault across the planet. Once you pick your vault hunter, you are visited by a strange live-action woman that appears in your sight. She asks you to get out of the bus and not ask questions. There isn't a lot of context to be had here. You navigate through the town of Firestone and begin getting used to and understanding the quest mechanics of the game. Most quests in the first Borderlands games are fetch quests. They're not great quests. Many in Firestone are great, however, including the missions where you meet NPCs like TK Baja and get to hear more from the outstanding voice acting and writing of Patricia Tannis. You're also going to be very much introduced to just the very basic core mechanics of Borderlands. And I would hate to summarize here, so I'll move quick. At level 5, you apply a skill point to your action skill, or for lack of a better term, your ultimate. Brick enters a berserk mode and begins punching wildly with his fists, causing elemental damage. Mordecai releases his trusty bird Bloodwing, who sweeps down and attacks. Lilith phase walks and turns invisible, doing damage around her feet. Roland places a turret because Roland is boring. Do you disagree? Don't comment below, you're actually wrong. You level up and apply skill points to a tree of statistical improvements and sometimes more radical changes. The skill trees in Borderlands 1 are less than stellar. They're not the worst I've seen, but only a couple of skills really differentiate the identity of the characters. Mordecai's skill that ignores shields comes to mind. That skill is ridiculous. Guns are separated into a Diablo-esque tier system. White for common, orange for legendary, yada yada. We will delve into how the guns work in Borderlands 1 soon. Most of the time you will be spent completing missions, and frankly most of those missions are boring. There are 127 missions in the vanilla game, with 47 of these being main questline missions. Most missions will drop a predetermined weapon or piece of gear, some much more better than others. The beginning of Borderlands has some interesting pacing. I get the feeling that a lot of people that have played the first game may not have made it past the starting mission area, Firestone. Firestone is an old settlement that houses Dr. Zed, and also where you meet one of the most iconic characters in the Borderlands series, CL4PTP, or Claptrap. You do some questing here and become familiar with the mechanics and world of the game, and I say that this is where many people might not have gone through because this area is sort of characterized by fetch quests and interesting difficulty spikes. If you're unfamiliar with the mechanics of the game, your first fight with Bonehead can be incredibly difficult. The game also has this really awful way of notifying you of quests, and most of those missions on the bounty board are pretty boring. Not doing these missions, however, can cause the more interesting missions to be impossibly difficult. This part of the game also is where the player will find one of the most important world building elements of the entire series, for better or for worse. These are audio logs, echo logs for Borderlands. Most of what goes on in the past events of Borderlands is communicated through these recorded relics particularly what happens to Tannis. And I do not feel uncomfortable saying that Patricia Tannis is the main character of the Borderlands series. The events that happen to her over the Borderlands series act as the inciting incidents, the rising actions, the climaxes, and the resolutions. Without Tannis, most of the events of the story couldn't happen. Without Tannis, there is no vault. And for this video, I read two books relevant to what I'm talking about here. I ordered Significant Zero by Walt Williams, a book about heroes, villains, and the fight for art and soul in video games. Williams is a video game writer, most known for his work on Spec Ops The Line, a game that you are almost certainly familiar with if you found a small video game analysis channel. He recently worked as a lead writer on Battlefront 2, which, despite your feelings on the game, that's a cool opportunity. He also helped as a writer on Borderlands 2. I also read a book called Ain't No Place for a Hero, Borderlands, by Caitlin Trimbley. This book acted as an extraordinarily refreshing take on the series. William's book helped enlighten a lot of what was going on during the production and back end of Borderlands 2. Trimboy's book helped enlighten what was going on within the text of all the games, and crucially allowed for a different perspective, one from a queer woman, something that is at a premium in video game analysis. Trimble has this awesome chapter on madness in the Borderlands games, and how it is inextricably linked to our reading of the games. 
Trimbley writes, In the beginnings, there's Tannis, a brilliant scientist who, after watching her colleagues be brutally murdered, one even on top of her, and pursuing the vault for too long, loses her sanity. But her delusional state provides the means for Tannis' survival. She has imagined conversations with her mother, which further her scientific thinking and allow her to work through her scientific thinking and allow her to work through her problems. Tannis enters into a dramatic on-again, off-again relationship with her echo recorder, which eases her isolation and loneliness. Tannis is only able to survive the harsh violence of Pandora by forgetting her sanity, a cruel fate for a scientist who prides herself on her objectivity and intelligence. And you see, that is almost precisely the prevailing underbelly of the denizens of Pandora. Madness. They are forced to live in their world, and so what else can they do but try and survive? Tannis' time on Pandora didn't turn her mad necessarily. Tannis turned herself mad because she had to, because without her madness, she would not have been able to fulfill her scientific desires. She knew what had to happen, she knew why she was on Pandora, and she also knew that the normal weights and barriers that inhibit the mind had to be removed if she was to complete her quest. Clearly, the bandits understood this as well. They created clans and civilizations, religions and cults. The madness took them over, but they didn't lose to it, and that's including Tannis. And Tannis acts as an interesting motivator and leader throughout the course of the game. As you move through the Mad Max-inspired desert wasteland, you begin to learn that the key to opening the vault is a collection of pieces of a key. These keys have been separated across Pandora in video game fashion, belonging to a number of different baddies. The thing about the vault is, is that it only opens every 200 years. There won't be another opportunity to open this. Unfortunately, this news becomes clear to many, including the Crimson Lance, a heavily armed mercenary group headed by what I guess is the main antagonist of the game, Commandant Steele. I say I guess she is the main antagonist because she is hardly an antagonist. She is absent from most of the game, and it isn't until the end that she poses any sort of real threat to you. You are unsure of her abilities, unconvinced by her voice acting, and at times unsure of her role in the whole grand scheme of things. And it goes without saying that those who know about the second Borderlands games know that Gearbox understood the antagonist deficiency in their first game. Borderlands fights with the problem of putting a lot of trust into its players. It trusts you that you are care enough about the mythology of the vault to see it through. The game needs you to trust it enough to say, okay, I am alright doing these uninspired quests because I am invested enough in the loot grind to continue. The game requires you to trust that its words are enough, that showing can't be telling because what needs to be shown can't be shown until the end. The game can tell you that the vault is full of immeasurable wealth, but it can't show you. This is playing an extremely dangerous game with your players. If they aren't totally bought into the actual actions of the game, the shooting, the loot, then they will have to no desire to see it through to the end. That is what Borderlands does. It trusts you to care so much about the contents of the vault that you don't need your antagonist to be an antagonist worthy of hatred. And I think something I might hear in the comments is something along the lines of two different readings here. The first being, there doesn't need to be an antagonist, or the second being, the antagonist is Tannis. And I am sympathetic to both of these to a degree. I don't feel like there has to be an antagonist in the traditional sense. The issue with this in regards to Borderlands, however, is that the antagonist needs to be replaced by something. Video games, we can't forget, are still a participatory medium. A movie requires a lot less goading in order to get through it. Video games generally are longer and require more effort on the end of the player. In the event of not having an antagonist, something else needs to goad the player forward. Destiny keeps its players involved for hundreds of hours despite any semblance of a compelling story. The gameplay in Loot Grind was enough. Sometimes there can be just enough of a mystery to move me forward. I'm reminded of The Witness when I think of this. I wanted to know what the end of the game was. I wanted to know what would happen when I connected all of the light beams. I'm unsure if Borderlands has those things. The vault is described as having loot. Loot? Okay, you mean guns? C cool. At the end of the game, though, it's not terribly convincing. The shooting, and we'll spend plenty of time discussing this, is not something I can't get anywhere else. What results is you either are invested enough in what is inside the vault, or you are invested enough in getting better loot. And that's why the game's lack of antagonist is concerning to me. And as far as Tannis as the antagonist, okay, I understand this. She does end up betraying the Vault Hunters near the third act of the game. And again, Tannis to me is past antagonist. She is the main character, and she is flawed, but she is self-motivated above all of that. 
When you view the story with her as the protagonist, you see a woman relentlessly determined to achieve her own goals. She is not working against herself or the Vault Hunters. It's through this reading that we can begin to sort of parse out the hierarchy of characters in the first Borderlands game. And what I mean by this is that we can begin to understand that Borderlands isn't so much about the Vault Hunters as it is the characters facilitating those Vault Hunters. You are a tool, a weapon for others to use for their own needs. And at this point in the game, you have your own selfish desires, hunting the Vault. And even with that being said, you know that everyone else knows that. You are the Vault Hunter after all. So you become a heavily armed opportunity for exploitation. Pretty much everyone involved in the first Borderlands game is interested in their own goals, not excluding yourself. Obviously this whole reading would need a massive makeover once we look into the second game, but for now the Vault Hunters have less existential goals and much more financial. Besides the frequent one-liners and screams of visceral exultation, the Vault Hunters in Borderlands 1 aren't really characters, at least not in the sense that they have any real impact on the story besides being intrepid slayers of men. The Vault Hunters certainly aren't too involved in cutscenes or the making of plans or speaking at all. The first Borderlands game is a story about Patricia Tannis. And it isn't unreasonable to look at this whole situation on Pandora as nothing more than a colonial tale told by the ones doing the colonizing. It becomes clear early on that you are not here on Pandora to attempt diplomacy. Immediately off the bust, you are encountered by warring groups of bandits fighting each other. Opening the gate just allows you to join the fray. Pandora isn't a place to barter, it's a place to engage in the commerce of ammunition. Combat is the main vehicle of communication for the planet's denizens. And I promise I am not getting too high up on my blue-haired liberal high horse here. I think this is not only a completely reasonable reading, but a reading intended by the writers, especially as we begin to look at Borderlands 2 and the City of Opportunity. We have seen it in real life time and time again. There is a land rich in minerals, and the prevailing powers come and decimate the lands in order to access those materials. If they leave empty-handed, they have no interest in rebuilding the human or physical cost of their forced residence. Borderlands is a story told from the perspective of the colonists. A lot of times throughout the game, you will hear some psycho or bandit yell at you saying, You never should have come here! And it's time like these that I am suddenly but briefly removed from my state of bloodlust. Time enough for me to consider, you know what, that psycho is probably right. We don't have any business here. They didn't want to be here, and they ended up making some sort of life for themselves. And suddenly, I am here, murdering indiscriminately. The Vault Hunters really never should have come to Pandora. Compelling art is always a little prophetic or relevant, and the themes and stories behind Borderlands setting is no different. Atlas and Dahl both know about possible riches lying on Pandora. Both go to Pandora in search of that gold, and upon not finding it, they leave the country to its own broken devices. Cults form, tyrannical regimes bubble to the surface. In the spirit of capitalism, it is no different than what happens when Walmart dips its fingers too far into a small town, or when the United States goes to the Middle East looking for black gold, establishes a democracy, then leaves expecting everything to be hunky-dory. Atlas, Dahl, and later Hyperion easily represent the sort of predatory, aggressive colonialism seen by countries today. The line between country and corporation blurs each and every day, and it is a uniquely fascinating take on futurism to assume that in the age of interplanetary civilization, corporations are just as much of a force in the colonial space as entire factions are. It's a frankly terrifying reality that does not seem to counter against the current tides of industry. I will take this second to read a tweet from tech YouTuber MKBHD. He says, fun fact, Apple's market cap is closing in on $1 trillion US. $1 trillion. If you had a trillion dollars, you could literally buy every single NFL, NBA, and MLS team, Ford, NASA, and 100,000 Teslas, and still have money left over. But you couldn't buy Apple. In 2018, Apple has risen to extraordinary heights. They are the titans of industry. Past any numbers, Apple has become so pervasive that they are almost country-like, at least in the sense that they have a direct link to a tremendously large amount of people. I can't think of a much more easy way to infiltrate the consciousness of people other than the cell phones and computers. And you see, Apple just makes the vehicles to see content. These analogous megacorporations begin to become even more terrifying in this sense when you start to consider your Amazon, Google, Facebooks, and Disneys. We are trending towards megacorporation conglomerates that are warring for pretty much every ounce of media. 
Imagine a world where Elon Musk develops the ability to move across planets and begin colonizing. It is not unrealistic, then, to imagine a private corporation colonizing a planet, finding some sort of resource, and then having the financial, cultural, and political power to easily be seen as massively influential players in the geopolitical space. I don't think we are all that far from this reality. And when you frame the foundation of Borderlands like this, it becomes clear that the game does have a vested interest in art. The game recalls colonial times, but it also acts as a cautionary prophetic tale for the influence of private corporations as colonial forces. I think that's kind of exciting and deserves recognition. As we move through the game, it becomes more and more clear that there is a formulaic design to the quest structure. I can't help but want to finish every quest, and at times the game sort of forces your hand towards doing so. Unless you are blessed by RNG, you may find that the game becomes far too tedious to play without doing all the side quests. The end of the first act really happens when you arrive at the town of New Haven. New Haven is the safe haven for the most important characters of the series, including Scooter. And Scooter to me is maybe my favorite NPC in video games. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I love this guy. He is the perfect encapsulation of the South, meets a warped sense of masculinity, meets an adorably incorrect way of navigating social situations. He is the Borderlands to me. He is partially insane, but still hanging on. He sees the absurdity of situations, but hangs on to the human connection. He is a capitalist, but in the most reckless way possible. Scooter is exactly what the denizens of Pandora represent, barely hanging on to humanity by the weakest of threads. I like Scooter a lot because I am unsure if he sees us as a tool for his own gain, and he might just be the only one. Scooter is joined in New Haven by Marcus and one of the main mission providers and New Haven's matriarch, Helena Pierce. The rest of the game will have you moving on through many different quests and areas, most of them interacting through a collection of areas called the Rust Commons. The Rust Commons are difficult for me to judge, mainly because most of them are used as transitional areas in which I hop into a car and move on towards the next area. There are a lot of quests here, but a majority of them are fetch quests or go kill this type quests. When I reach this time in the game, I'm always a little bored. Of course, this is unfortunately a prevailing theme throughout the entire game, and maybe one of the reasons why people tend to not finish this game. Much has been said about this kind of gameplay, about this indiscriminate slaughter through humanoids. I'm unsure if I have anything to add, but I am sure that in terms of Borderlands, it is interesting to see how the characters in the Borderlands games have a vested interest in this sort of repeat of bloodshed. Marcus does certainly, at least in the sense that before he's a friend of the Vault Hunters, he is a friend of his company, Marcus Munitions. I'm not questioning Marcus's intentions here, I actually think that it is pretty cool how he is open about his intentions. As the Vault Hunter lives and dies and kills, Marcus makes money. Marcus's interest in the Vault Hunter's progress through the world can always be backhanded by a capitalist motivation. I love this about his character, and I love how his motivations waver as the series goes on. Marcus is a ruthless amoralist, a capitalist with a Russian accent, directly juxtaposing himself against his communist counterparts. And I love how close he is to an Ayn Rand clone here, clearly coming from a Russian environment, just like Rand did, and coming out a ruthless bootstrapper. Marcus, to me, is one of the main characters of the whole game. His mythologizing of Pandora and the Vault sets the tone for the entire game. Which is interesting, because he is quoted on many occasions saying that the Vault is almost assuredly not real. Get this, because it is absolutely an important part of Marcus's character. Marcus can be seen saying, I understand that believing in the improbable gives us hope, but if that vault existed, someone would have found it decades ago. Or he also said, far be it from me to put a damper on chasing a dream, but that vault's about as likely as having Skaggs invite us to a tea party. It's almost as if Marcus has other priorities in terms of telling you the vault is real. It's almost as if he knows the death toll and ammunition toll that comes with four heavily armed vault hunters colonizing Pandora. It's almost as if he lied to you at the beginning. It's almost as if you are, as we've learned, a tool. A tool for the capitalists. A tool not for the selfish, but for the self-determined. And as the game continues, this idea that you are some tool for everyone else, it reaches its zenith. Hopefully this feeling should be pretty clear by the start of the third act of the game. As the Vault Hunter, or Hunters, you have collected vault pieces up until this point by will of Patricia Tannis in Rust Commons West. It's here that Tannis, and remember you are a tool, quote-unquote betrays you by order of Commandant Steel. Tannis orders you towards Baron Flint, implying that he has the final piece of the vault key. 
After killing Flint and what ends up being one of the cooler fights of the whole game, you walk towards the usual chest that usually holds the usual vault key. It's empty, however, and you are immediately reached on the echo log by Commandant Steele. There was no peace at Baron's throne. Tannis just wanted him dead for her own reasons. She also insinuates that Tannis had betrayed the vault hunters, giving the Crimson Lance the vault pieces instead. Tannis later mentions that she was captured, but she also mentions that Tannis went along with the plan to have Flint killed because it seemed like something the vault hunters would enjoy. This is verbatim from the game. And this is where the whole betrayal in this game becomes a bit interesting. I'm unsure if Tannis actually betrayed the vault hunters. I will read to you what the post-quest dialogue has to say. I see you either received my message or came here on some other errand. The Lance locked me in here and shut down the Echo, but they left my communicator with me. That was really stupid of them. You probably hate me, but I didn't intend to betray you. Steele wanted the key and wanted you gone. Sending you after Baron Flint was her idea, and it seemed like something you'd enjoy, so I went along with it. Now I'm trapped here, and she's taken the vault key. If that post-quest description isn't enough to tell you the approach to storytelling that the first Borderlands game has, I don't know what will. Okay, I mean she pretty much calls out the own quest writing's mistake here and mentions them as being really stupid. Okay, fine, that's totally normal approach to storytelling, especially in video games. Video games are, in fact, notorious for these sort of storytelling shortcuts, and when they are acknowledged and accepted, sometimes they can be excused or even used as comedy. But stick with me for a bit here, in terms of the Tannis actually did betray you department. Maybe that quest writing isn't bad, maybe it's the opposite. Imagine that the Crimson Lance and Tannis are still in cahoots here, that they are still working together. Tannis is imprisoned, but still has snuck in communications with the Vault Hunters? Imagine maybe that this was all part of their plan and that the Vault Hunters, after killing Baron Flint, have proven themselves capable of even the most extraordinary feats of combat. Both Tannis and Steel both know that the path up to the Vault is a path completely covered in horrible beasts, bandits, and crucially, Iridian Guardians and it means they can eviscerate Crimson Lance soldiers with a look. These Guardians are pretty enigmatic through the entire game. There is some opportunity to see their architecture and hear from them, and you get the idea that the aliens are protecting something on Pandora, maybe a little more important than just loot. Considering that you have been nothing but a tool for pretty much everyone throughout the entire game, it is not unrealistic to imagine that the Crimson Lance see you as the most valuable and useful tool in the entire store, it is not unrealistic to imagine that they might see your ability as a slayer of men as a tool of the utmost utility. Steel is using Tannis as a tool, and Tannis is using us as a tool. As we navigate up the mountain towards the vault, however, we suddenly realize that no, Tannis was using all of us as a tool. In what has long been considered an extremely disappointing ending, Borderlands ends with a long trek up a snowy mountain, fighting wave after wave after wave of enemies. This part of the game is absolutely, without a doubt, indisputably easier when you play as Mordecai, considering that these enemies are almost all shields and no health. Mordecai's ability to ignore shields makes this whole trek a cakewalk. Brick, however, made the experience much more difficult. After reaching the top, after being teased with a boss fight against Commandant Steel and opening the vault to immeasurable wealth, you are instead met with disappointment, and pretty much all of the boxes I just mentioned. So, Commandant Steele made it there first, with assembled vault key in hand. She does some villain talking and then opens the vault. As she does, however, a tentacle comes out and goes right through her gut, putting a plot hole right in her chest. Steele had just been killed by the Destroyer, this titanic, one-eyed, iridian monster imprisoned within the vault. This fight can either be the most obnoxious thing in the world or the most obnoxiously simple thing in the world. Its health bar is huge, but a well-equipped, well-specced brick can take it down with relative ease. It becomes obnoxious when you do not have the perfect equipment for it, in which it becomes one of the most bullet-spongy, least interesting fights I have ever fought in an action RPG like this. This fight is brutal, and it is so, so simple. This creature, this destroyer, has about three different attacks for itself, all of which are anything but threatening after seeing them more than once. This fight is painfully disappointing, painfully boring, and most of all, symptomatic of a culmination of all the boss designs of the game to this point. But I guess we haven't gotten there yet. The Destroyer is defeated, and loot is exploded everywhere, for no real reason, I guess, than the developers admitting to the player that they knew that the end was a disappointment, and they must give the player something. And you know what? That's that. That's the end of Borderlands. That's it. And you know what? 
Tannis, she won. She opened the vault and found out what was inside. She successfully landed on the planet, removed herself from subjectivity, manipulated self-serving people, and won. She won. She played both Steel and the player because she knew that it didn't matter who got there first. One of us wouldn't make it out alive. She knew that we were capable. She knew that Steel was capable. When there is a job to be done that you yourself cannot do with your hands, you find the best tool for the job. The DLC offerings of Borderlands 1 are good. There's a lot of content for the price, but I'm unsure if it's meaningful content. The first offering, The Zombie Island of Dr. Zed, is a collectathon nightmare with some endearing visuals and some boring quests. Mad Moxie's DLC is an arena based horror mode that yields some good loot and good opportunities for farming. I like how in this DLC, Moxie will address the Vault Hunter specifically and give out some more character defining dialogue. I think it was clear that Gearbox was in the early stages of Borderlands 2 here and realized that they needed to flesh out the original four Vault Hunters a bit more. The Secret Armory of General Knox DLC is by far the best of the lot and gives the players some knowledge about Atlas' involvement in the race to the Vault, as well as introduce a character named Athena, a Crimson Lance assassin who helps you take down the Atlas Corporation. This DLC also introduces the Invincible type of boss, or basically a raid boss type enemy, Cromorax is a son of a biscuit eater to kill Solo. The final DLC, Claptrap's New Robot Revolution, is another collectathon DLC obviously built with the intention of guiding hardcore players towards Hyperion, and crucially towards Borderlands 2, which had to have been firmly in development at this point. These DLCs are absolutely more of the same Borderlands, and having played through all of them in their completion, every quest, even the collectible ones, I am unsure that they add anything meaningful to the holistic product that is Borderlands besides the story moments in General Nox's DLC. And at the end of that General Nox's DLC, the player is given an opportunity to run through Nox's armory and loot as many chests as possible within two minutes. Over the radio, you are repeatedly reminded to give yourself time to escape before the bomb goes off, blowing up the fortress of General Nox. The thing is, you don't. And listen, you don't because you don't even try. You are more interested in maxing out the amount of loot you can possibly get. Even though you don't, even if you tried, you can't. You are destined to die in that fortress, to respawn outside of the fortress as if nothing happened. This is a direct message from the developers. Loot over life. Look, Borderlands isn't absolutely about the little color that beams out of the item that drops on the ground. Borderlands games don't put multiple playthroughs in their games because they know players are dying to experience the riveting story of Pandora multiple times, Borderlands games add multiple playthroughs because of the promise of new, more interesting loot. And know how I didn't say better guns. The Siren's Call of Higher Damage numbers isn't exactly what drives players towards grinding out better weaponry. It's a lot of times how unique the weapon is. How does it feel in your hands? A gun that may feel excellent as you're blowing through the crimson fastness may not be nearly as effective as the gun you used to take on Mothrak. Many, many weapons are next to useless when fighting through mobs that are absolutely shredders when fighting a large bullet sponge enemy like the Rack Hive. And even past that is a weapon's character and aesthetic. Not all guns look, shoot, or act the same. It's here that I have to levy my first major criticism of the first Borderlands game. The weapons are the show of Borderlands, right? They're the draw pointed to in the marketing. They're the point of interest in terms of Borderlands as a piece of software considering the game has managed an extraordinary amount of unique weaponry. Borderlands weapons don't distinguish themselves much past the normal classifications of shotgun, assault rifle, sniper rifle, submachine gun, and wait, repeater and revolver? Those are two different classifications here. It's bizarre, but okay. So let's break this down once and for all. Borderlands 1 generates its weapons in a unique way. According to Gearbox, there are over 17,750,000 different variations of weapons in the first Borderlands game. These are not, however, unique specifically crafted weapons. Borderlands uses a procedurally generated process to generate and differentiate its weapons in the game. Looking at a gun on the ground or in a chest allows for the item card to show up. The item card reveals a number of statistics about the gun, the manufacturer of the weapon, and also, the, what's very important, the level of the gun. Each gun in the game can come in each level. It goes without saying that a level 69 weapon is significantly higher statistically than a level 35 weapon. The level, levels do matter. Okay, 
Here's how the weapons are broken down in Borderlands 1. We will compare how this differs from the second game and figure out which system had it right. There are 12 different modifications a gun goes through before it appears on your screen. First, the game determines the weapon type, so it's like rifle, revolver, etc. Then it determines the manufacturer, of which there are 9, 10 if you include Iridian. Each has different stat bonuses, like a Jacob's weapon carrying significantly more damage. The game will then determine the weapon grade or rarity color. The weapon's rarity is basically the overall cumulative value of all the parts a weapon is made of. Okay, parts. Borderlands guns aren't singular values per se. They are amalgamations of multiple weapon parts, such as gun stock, barrel, magazine, body, material, accessory, grip, or sight. Each weapon, besides launchers who have three, have five different body types that the game chooses between. The fifth being the best body type. A lot of times you can tell about the gun's body because it will be in the name of the gun. Otherwise, if you know how to tell the bodies visually, you can tell that way. The game then does the same thing with each part. For example, barrel 1, stock 3, etc. The gun that appears in a chest will then be a combination of all of those different parts. So upon opening a chest, the gun is rolled in the order just said. If you have all of the five iterations of a weapon, that means your gun will be very, very good. Legendary, even. Finally, the gun is assigned a prefix, such as steel, or savage, or liquid. The prefix of a gun is determined by the parts of a gun and can further influence the statistical benefits that the gun parts have already placed onto the gun. <laughs> Add in elemental weapons and suddenly it becomes clear how many weapons can be created within the Borderlands universe. This is on top of the amount of actually unique weapons, such as legendaries, that have their own specified and unusual traits. This all happens in a matter of milliseconds upon having a gun appear on your screen. It's a unique way of dealing with your weapons in a game. But is it preferable? It's iconic, but is it good game design? Well, it comes down to what you want in your looter shooter. Are you looking for unique weapons? Because you are in for a rough time in the first Borderlands game. It's actually because of this and a couple other reasons that I think a lot of people that I've talked to have not made it out of Firestone, which is the first area in the game. A lot of people try the game and get bored at first. The weapons in the beginning are boring and samey, which, you know, makes sense, by the way, because as you move throughout the game, they become nicer and more unique. But of course, you don't have that sort of context when you first play the game. Also, one thing you will find me criticizing a lot in games is this enemy variety. To me, there's few things worse in game design than to have an action, but nothing interesting to do that action toward. Objectively, I cannot criticize this about Borderlands, mainly because there is a lot of different interesting enemies in the game. What I can criticize about the game is that the game does a very poor job establishing this within the first third of the game. You will be killing a lot of skags early on in the game, and you will get very tired of skags early on in the game. When I imagine a lot of the more interesting fights and enemies in the game, most of them arrive post New Haven. You shouldn't have to be trusted to push through the first part of a game just to get to a part that is promised to be different and exciting. Because of the way that the guns are developed, you are looking at some overwhelming ubiquity in your weaponry. Most guns are bullet firing, most are automatic, excluding the ones that are obviously semi-automatic, and most are indistinguishable from each other besides the numbers assigned to them. It might be my biggest complaint of the whole game. The weaponry is just not compelling enough visually or mechanically to warrant any sort of interest past just higher DPS. For some, that's enough. For me, I think that's barely enough. For a lot, however, they need a little bit more. And if you've been watching this video so far, you have probably seen what I mean. As you progress through the game and you start getting weapons with higher body numbers and higher material numbers, which are the ones that would affect the gun most visually, your guns begin to look a little more interesting visually. I do like this as it fits thematically within the game, but I don't like how it is about the extent of the differences. This will be approved upon dramatically in the second game, despite people still arguing that the loot system is better designed in Borderlands 1. And I think the main reason people prefer the loot of Borderlands 1 is the way that the game handles legendaries and the dropping of said legendaries. For example, in Borderlands 1, legendaries are determined by the values we discussed earlier. So bosses don't drop specific legendaries. Legendaries in Borderlands 1 are almost exclusively going to come from world drops or from chests. Because of that, there is rarely a time in which you can't get a legendary. A normal bandit might give you one. People like this uncertainty. People like that chests are a little more powerful and exciting as a good percentage of them actually might have a legendary inside. 
However, the issue with this is that, well, it's random. And hey, maybe that's what you want. But I was getting a little sick of receiving another Hellfire, although I was carrying two more in my inventory. If I want to search for a specific Pestilent Defiler, I have to hope and pray to the gods to get it. I can do legendary farming, but all that really consists of is going to high concentration areas and opening a lot of chests. I prefer to have a little more control. In my playthrough with Brick, I went about 30 levels before getting a legendary. I mean, this could conceivably happen within Borderlands 2 weapon system, but if I wanted it not to, I could go through the effort of re-killing a boss until he drops one. There isn't really much more I can do in Borderlands 1. And there are a number of nitpicky type problems I have with the game, a lot of them stemming from the technical side of the software. And I'm unsure why when I'm in Berserk as Brick that opening my map will instantly stop the Berserk and put the skill on cooldown. Like why? That is frustrating and unnecessary as a gameplay feature. I wish the developers had planned a bit more for the higher levels as well, especially near level 69, the max level. Enemy balance is okay, but it's the little things like your money being so high that the game can't show you how much you really have. The counter only shows up to $10 million, but I know at times I had well over $100 million, as when I would die I would lose over $30 million and nothing would change. I would still have 999999 or whatever. Actually, not as pedantic of a complaint as you would think. This happens for a good majority of playthrough 2 and it makes buying legendary weapons pretty much a complete crapshoot to the economic hole you will put yourself into. The field of view is locked into a painfully close perspective. The engine has a hard time agreeing with any frame rate above 60. Unlocking the frame rate for a 144Hz monitor can actually sometimes, and I'm not exaggerating, sometimes but not all the time, speed the entire game up proportionally to the frame rate. Bizarre, because Wolfenstein The New Order on PC would do this exact same thing. So aim punch during segments with a lot of enemies is pretty much unbearable and headache inducing, and so is the sound design in those situations. A game like this should thrive in situations where enemies overwhelm you. Solution? I think widen the FOV. Creating a first person shooter action role playing game like this requires a certain degree of mastery in regards to enemy and boss design. This might just be the most difficult thing to design actually considering one thing, and that's variables. With the way the items are generated in the game, the developers cannot possibly ensure that the player will be encountering each boss with the same amount of damage per second. Developers can link certain weapons to certain mandatory quests, but as we've learned, one version of the same gun can be not nearly as effective as another, depending on its part or prefix. So what can developers do? How much of an onus is on the player to figure this out for themselves? Do developers have a design obligation to make all bosses have a static health pool? Or do they have a design obligation to go through the difficult and easily broken work of having the boss's health be determined by the value of the player's gear? Let's look at the final boss, a boss that is considered historically disappointing and uninspired. The destroyer has the possibility of requiring an astronomical amount of lead to destroy. In my second playthrough, with doing every side quest, the fight took an exorbitant amount of time. It was painful, boring, and required next to zero amount of critical thinking or skill on my part to kill. I mean, is there any more vile sin in a game like this other than uninspired boss design? Isn't the boss the ultimate fruits of the labor, the climax of our lead-fueled foreplay? Isn't the utter destruction of a boss the great catharsis of a looter shooter such as this? In my high school class, I know that if I give an assignment that, when returned, is universally failed, it's not my student's fault. It's my fault. Somewhere along the way, the formula was busted. Somewhere along the way, something disconnected from me and my students, and they were unsure of what to do. That is, poor test design. A bad boss is poor game design. Imagine that throughout the year, students are subjected to different study materials throughout the year on a random basis. They are all promised a textbook, but one might have better information. One might have ripped out pages. One might have an online component that helps the student a lot. If this were the case, the test at the end of the unit would be the same for everyone. Would I expect consistent results? Would I expect the students who have had a harder time getting guns to do as well as those who have just got really lucky? Would those who got the luckiest of the lucky, the book with all of the test answers, would I expect them to really learn much or anything or have an enriching experience? This hypothetical doesn't really work as soon as we make it more analogous to Borderlands and ask ourselves, well, the students have the ability to go out there and grind for more study materials. They should be expected to do that if they have to. But I'm unsure if that's a requirement. Should that be for a game like this? 
There were times in my second playthrough where boss encounters were an absolute chore, and I hate to phrase it this way because I am unsure how else. I've played hundreds of hours of the Borderlands games in my life. I believe that the failures here was a failure of, well, the, the teacher, on the, the developer. I'm mixing up my analogies. If we do consider boss encounters as the test of our materials, then it becomes difficult to reconcile that kind of horribly annoying boss design. One of the most difficult things to consider and analyze in an action RPG is boss and enemy design. It's difficult because of the amount of items there are. The window for where a player could be is just enormous. If you go to fight the Rack Hive, you could be the same level as the boss and either be able to kill him in 10 minutes or 40 minutes, depending on what was randomly dropped for you previous to that point. How are game designers supposed to navigate that issue? You see, when you have an action game like God of War, every player is doing roughly the same damage with each kind of attack. The developer can create bosses and enemies around that narrow window, that narrow window of variance. In Borderlands, the window of variance is canyon-esque. This is where I think Borderlands could have done a lot more with the skill trees in ways other than just basic stat increases. Kill skills like Brick's Master Blaster skill is an incredible skill, one that completely changes the character and turns Brick into a murdering machine. However, it is almost unusable against bullet spongy bosses. In fact, most of Brick's skills encourage mobbing, not bossing. A specific skill tree devoted to taking down bosses would have been a welcome change. I think it is through this analysis that we can begin to see that the developers were highly prioritizing loot over the skills or character progression. It's why the developers chose not to give the character skills, at least not in the sense that there aren't a number of activated moves that you can perform besides your action skill. Had they done this, they would be taking a little bit of the emphasis away from the guns, which we've learned is the real star of the show here. So much that I don't think it's irrational for me to place a completely arbitrary ratio on the game that says that your effectiveness as a slaughterer of monsters is 80% your guns and 20% your skills. It also implicitly establishes through the gameplay that the materials, the things you own, define you more so than yourself. When I have instances like this in games that are all about numbers, I'm reminded that the point of the game is those numbers. The point is the bigger number, and a game that is defined by these numbers, a story that is ruled over by mega corporations, it becomes clear that Gearbox is absolutely focusing in on the sort of siren call of capitalism, of the newest best thing, of never being happy with what you have. This game is absolutely being critical of capitalism. It's not a total indictment. It is no piece of like socialist propaganda. It's a crude comparison of what capitalism is versus what it could be. It's through this that Borderlands makes a little more sense to me. Not necessarily as a coherent piece of software, but as a coherent piece of art, of meaningful rhetoric. When I'm playing games, I can, at times, be skeptical about if the game that I am playing is the same game that the creative minds of the development team wanted. At times, I'm curious of the influence of publisher pressures, of societal pressures even. At times, it's messy. It's certainly no masterpiece. But it kind of works, and I think it works in the ways that the developers wanted it to work. It's through that that I think the first Borderlands game actually succeeds. In pretentious literature analysis circles, one of the most discussed and sophomoric discussions that can be had is that of the hero. How do we judge heroism? How do we pick and choose which characters in a story are heroic and which are evil? Even when there are clear goods and evils, someone will still argue otherwise. When we read Milton's Paradise Lost as Satan the Hero, there is certainly an industry of scholarship on this idea, so it is absolutely clear that the definition of what a hero is has been muddied along the way somewhere. Above all else, above capitalism or Tannis or any other thing I may touch base on here, Borderlands 2 is a game demanding the player to consider what it means to be a hero, to consider what it means to be a villain, and the moral canyons or hairline fractures that separate the two. It goes without saying that we aren't necessarily talking about superheroes here, and we also aren't talking about heroes in the sense of, you know, firefighters or teachers. We're talking about the differences here, however subtle or implicit, between our preconceived notions of heroes versus tragic heroes. We're speaking about what it means to be a moral actor in a space devoid of binary moralities. Who amongst the abhorrent and depraved of Pandora can claim the title of hero? Does someone even have to? Borderlands 2 takes place five years after the events of the first game. 
the opening of the vault, and the destruction of the destroyer. Where the previous game's antagonistic company is Atlas, this game starts the Hyperion Corporation, signaled by a monolithic spaceship in the shape of an H, blotting out the light from nearby sources. Leading Hyperion is Handsome Jack, president of said Hyperion Corporation, who looks to mine and secure this new resource and bring peace to the planets of savages. In terms of our readings of the game as colonial, westernized vulturism, it becomes pretty obvious that Anthony Birch, writer of Borderlands 2, had a bit to say about the ways in which western countries use their might to gather materials across boundaries. I get the feeling he had a bit to say about the ways in which the United States enters Middle Eastern countries, gather resources, and then use quasi-moral justifications for their entry, like the implementation of democracy. Borderlands 2 takes the elements of Borderlands 1 that were lacking and adds them, excelling at them, and even excelling at the things that Borderlands 1 already had excelled at. I believe that this game is an incredible piece of software, a stunning use of the medium that encourages fun, thought, competition, motivation, and laughter. It clearly hasn't been inducted into that transcendent tier of video game hierarchy, and you know, that's okay. It clearly hasn't been recognized alongside the Zeldas and Marios, and again, that's alright. For Borderlands 2, it hits every note for me. It's a symphony of excellent game design, and it acts as an addictive gameplay loop that tickles all of my video game fancies. And it goes without saying that this position is not really held by everyone. The game released to incredible critical reception, yet I still find, anecdotally of course, that the game does not appeal to everyone. Now I try not to speak anecdotally like this, but it's hard for me to ignore the fact that I have played through this game with people and they have actually told me, a couple of missions into the game, that they are bored or unconvinced by the game. We've already touched on how the art style has potentially created this problem, but I think there is more to it, especially in the second title. The game is translucent in its motivation. The authorship of the game is clear is what I'm trying to say. It's political, social, and economic principles discursive in its rhetoric. For 2012, a couple years before Donald Trump made a habit of inspiring politically charged pieces of media, Borderlands 2 was incredibly rhetorical in its creation. The game made headlines based on social commentaries, gender and sexuality stances, opinions on colonialism, feminism, and its opinion on southern culture. The authorship of Anthony Birch has a tendency to immediately set people off against the game. For example, the siren Maya is asexual and in no need of a man to come and save her. Conversely, Moxie is a beacon of sexual ownership, of unapologetic sexiness. She stands as a self-made woman who has no desire to shroud her real desires. And I love Moxie. In my experience, women gamers love Moxie. Caitlin Tremblay, author of Ain't No Place for a Hero, Borderlands, certainly like Moxie. Moxie is an excellent example of that sort of authorship I was talking about. It's the developer asking the player to think about the ways in which women are portrayed in video games, to expect one thing and to realize that Moxie is not at all that thing. Yes, the developers made her look sexual, but they also made her live it, understand it, and have the nuance to make it realistic, the characterization to make her sexuality empathetic and self-motivated. Add on to that Mr. Torg's constant screams of feminism and the developer's attempt to avoid heteronormative, he, heter, heteronormativity, and it begins to be clear that the game is making a point. And that's great. Games should make points. Things should make points, and this point is a good point to make. The conversation here is a conversation of vital information versus non-vital information. This is to say, people may be asking, why does it matter that Maya is asexual or that Sir Hammerlock is gay? What does this have to do with anything happening in the game? It doesn't, and that's the point. You're asking the wrong question if that's what you're asking. Instead, we should be asking, what does it cost to include a line of dialogue about Maya's sexuality? The answer is nothing, or at least next to nothing. See, in the middle of development, players realized that Axton, one of the more masculine vault hunters, would respond to every vault hunter with phrases like, hey, do you work out? And other flirtatious lines. Now, this was originally meant to only proc when being revived by a female vault hunter, but it applied to all, even Krieg. This led players, naturally, to believe that Axton was bisexual. The writers hadn't intended this, but they crucially didn't fix it, because... Well, why would you? What is the cost of changing that? Axton as a character changes pretty inconsequentially to the rest of the story, and now you've just included an entire demographic of gamers into the game that weren't previously represented. At effectively no cost to the developer, inclusion is possible. 
There's so many opportunities to do this that designers ignore. Add on to that that it doesn't come off as self-congratulatory, as if they were saying, look how many gay people we have in our game. It becomes clear that Borderlands 2 is concerned with including as many diverse people as it can. If I'm going to be critical, though, I think that Birch's progressive nature is weirdly inconsistent in this game. And look, I am no arbiter of what is okay and what is not okay. I'm not in some sort of game critic that says this social commentary is okay and this one is problematic. That's not my call to make. However, there is a troubling dissonance to how much care and attention Borderlands 2 gives to gender, sexuality, and race, yet is dreadfully obtuse and jarring in regards to ability and suicide. In regards to ability, I'm blown away how they have enemies titled Psycho Suicide Midgets. And in regards to suicide, I do find it unbelievable at times that they have such a cavalier approach to mental health issues in their game. There's this quest in which a woman shoots herself in the head after Scooter writes her a poem. It's the punchline to a small, inconsequential quest about Scooter's unwarranted advances towards a woman. There's a quest titled Kill Yourself. It seems strange, inconsistent, and it certainly didn't make me feel great. If we operate under the premise that pieces of dialogue and quest writing like this are inconsequential to the main story yet can hold potent power, then we must look at it in the inverse way. If these pieces of dialogue and quest writing are inconsequential to the story, and they are potentially harmful to a demographic of players, why include them? I guess this is the price of creating a culturally sensitive video game, right? It may not ever be good enough. For the uncomfortable, the game is pushing a liberal agenda. For the sensitive, the game is ignoring certain specific groups. For most, I imagine the game is fine as. Finally, on the entire list of reasons why people may be averse to Borderlands 2, I believe that the humor hasn't aged nearly as well as the rest of the game has. It's meme it's referential, and a little, okay, a lot a bit cringy. I think it is often seen as trying too hard. I can't say I disagree with that one. For me, when it lands, it lands. The game has some hilarious bits. The introduction to Borderlands 2 is a good one. It's an improvement over the introduction on the first game and the similarities, getting off a vehicle, claptrap waiting for you, getting your first gun, all encourage you to recognize and think about how similar each Vault Hunter's journeys are. It's also vitally important that the game starts you off in a snowy tundra, as it is a direct response to the criticism of the first game being too sandy and desolate. You move through the tundra, meet the intrepid Victorian gentleman Sir Hammerlock, save Claptrap from some of Pandora's more vicious bandits. A side quest in this area allows for one of the coolest moments, I think, in the whole series, and it's communicated entirely through audio logs. One of the most important characters from Borderlands 1, as we know, Helena Pierce, is introduced speaking into the audio log. Not much has been communicated about Handsome Jack at this point. We know he's snarky and cocky, but we don't know much about the extent of his ability as an actual villain. I remember playing this for the first time and thinking to myself that it was such an awesome introduction towards Handsome Jack's villainy. It transforms the man from a ruthless wonder boy who succeeded in business to, holy crap, this guy actually is a sociopath. The way it is spaced out between audiologues breaks up the story enough to be haunting in the ways in which you try to figure out what comes next. Jack's murder of Helena Pierce and his ensuing pillaging of New Haven immediately sets the tone for who Jack is, what he and the Hyperion people are capable of, and how little he cares about his morality. I always thought that if a Borderlands movie was ever made, which has often been a rumor and even a factual possibility, this is how they should open the movie. It's the perfect microcosm to showing Jack's psychopathic capability. As you help the first game's Vault Hunter Roland, you gain access to the home base and hub city of Borderlands 2, Sanctuary. Sanctuary is a marked improvement over New Haven from the first game. I love how the game took the platforming challenges in New Haven to a new degree in Sanctuary. There are so many routes to getting onto the roofs, and just when you think that you grenade jumped yourself into a roof that you weren't supposed to get onto, there's a small chest up there just to say, ha, you're not special. And I love that. Sanctuary is home to most quest givers in the game and eventually houses the previous Vault Hunters from Borderlands 1, Vault Hunters that take on a wealth of new personality that they weren't afforded in the original game. Mordecai is an alcoholic, his relationship to Bloodwing much more personal and endearing. Roland has become the leader of the Resistance and maintains a stoic, professional demeanor. Roland is a hero in the traditional sense, a moral lighthouse that really has no business on Pandora. Which, you know... 
Brick is a bandit leader, a character devoted to deconstructing toxic masculinity and his ability to be sensitive and forgiving despite his beefcake looks. Finally, the Firehawk Lilith, the siren from the first game, becomes an integral piece in the story of Borderlands 2. Lilith is, as we've learned, a siren, one of six in the Borderlands universe. All sirens are mystical, powerful, incredible, and women. They all have mysterious blue tattoos that run down through their body. We have met four total sirens at this point in the game. Lilith, the Firehawk, Maya, the playable siren in Borderlands 2, Angel, which comes in a bit of a reveal later in the game, even though she says things like executing phase shift as early as the first area in the game, Phase Walk and Phase Lock are integral motifs in the Siren's toolkit, so it's not much of a reveal. The final is Commandant Steel, the antagonist from the previous game. What we find out upon meeting Lilith is that she thrives, hell she lives off Iridium. It's the new ore spawning from Pandora's orifices. Patricia Tannis, a character who maintains her importance to the story in this game, seems to think that Lilith's power that she gains from Iridium suggests that maybe there's a wider connection between the Sirens of the vaults spread around Pandora and the Iridians, the ancient aliens we met in the first game. All of this encourages the player to think that maybe a lot of the different things happening on Pandora are widely connected around the vaults. It further encourages the idea that the vaults are larger than that of treasure, and that they actually hold some significance past just... loot. Tannis is still really interesting in this game because of her ability to go from having a contractual obligation to Dahl in the first game, to having a more ethical obligation to Roland in the Resistance in the second game. She grows a lot as a hero, and maintains her space as the most important character in the Borderlands universe by continuing her research on the second vault. Her motivation is no longer toward anything other than the survival of Pandora without Jack. I also love that Tannis is a main character, and she is a main character with autism. I have to say, there just isn't that much representation of this particular condition outside of your usual stereotypes. Tannis' mo moments of perseverance and overcoming in the face of her autism and her torture are absolutely something to behold and admire in the series. Tannis also continues to be the perfect liaison of Pandora in her somewhat functioning, tenuous grasp on sanity. I love this character, her torture by the hands of Handsome Jack to reveal information about the vault, only further her as a tragic role in this world. The game makes a clear point in commanding the player's attention to Lilith as a main character as well. Her voice acting is completely different than it was in the previous game, and she has taken on a persona of a completely casual, ruthless, and forward-thinking woman. Lilith exudes confidence, holds very little regard for the manners of being traditionally ladylike, and has an obscene amount of power. Her ability to transport herself and others is a mighty asset to the team. I think that the inclusion and importance of the Sirens is more evidence toward the writers of Borderlands making the mythology of the world one of the most important pieces of the canon. Of course, the name Siren comes from Greek mythology. I'm not sure if I'm ready to make the connection of the anthropomorphic vultures who sing and seduce sailors to their doom, but it is something to point out. Lilith isn't overly sexualized, or even seen as any sort of seductress. She struggles with making Roland like her in one of the missions, as she stumbles through her flirtation. Lilith's character design isn't even that overtly sexual, and to say that is to be a little weird? I don't know, I feel immediately skeptical of those who say that Lilith is sexualized in any meaningful way. I mean, she's attractive, sure, but to say that she's overly sexualized is to be so used to attractive women in games being sexualized that any level of nuance or spectrum of sexuality has been reduced to either sex icon or modest warrior. The other sirens are no different, really. Maya is asexual. Angel is, well, she certainly has much bigger problems. The Commandant Steel, well, I guess she did get Pin it. No. I, I think they named them this because all the sirens are war women. I think that is a little odd, but to give the writers credit, I think it's less about the seductress part of the sirens and more about the power through femininity angle. I love how the game uses a consistent iconography for all of the sirens, and I love how they do it subtly. I'm not talking about the tattoos, which are pretty clearly a connection between all of the sirens, but I'm talking about things like the wings. The wings! It's such a cool touch that I hadn't considered until recently. Lilith establishes the wings by being, you know, the firehawk. She has these massive wings of fire, and it's awesome. When you play with Maya, she uses the Blight Phoenix skill, and she has giant wings appear. 
tie that into the whole her name is Angel thing, the sirens taking on different sorts of neon colors, and the fact that they are all women, and the sirens become one of the most interesting subjects in all of the Borderlands universe. Lilith informs you that Roland has been captured and that it's of the utmost importance that you go save him from his captors. She then teleports you, which is an obviously insanely useful utility to have. It doesn't say a whole lot more about it afterward. She is still working on the process of teleporting things, something she hasn't really gotten the hang of. Uh, foreshadowing. After arriving at a place called The Dust, the Vault Hunters meet an NPC named Ellie, a sister of my favorite character, Scooter. Their mom is actually Moxie, which is explicitly said in the game, but it might have been missed, so I think it's a pretty cool touch. I don't love the dust as an area in the game. I hate the missions where you have to drive around blowing up the cars. I didn't enjoy them in the previous game, and I don't enjoy them here. I don't get why they do that mission and then offer a second side quest literally right after you turn in that quest, where you do the exact same thing. This kind of quest design is normal in a lot of games, but not too normal in Borderlands. I do, however, like the dust because I like Ellie. She is awesome, powerful, sexually confident, and imposing. Caitlin Trimbley likes her because she is a character in a video game who is large, and it isn't the butt of a joke. Her weight isn't ignored or ridiculed. It's an asset, a characteristic, but one of many. As we go through these characters, it will have already become clear to the player whether or not they have bought into these characters as pieces of social rhetoric, or if you have disregarded them as virtue signaling props. And I feel like you, the listener, might have already taken a stance on the game or my analysis of the game. I am aware of the social commentary here and how tired it may seem in media today. I would just ask you to be sympathetic and understanding that to analyze Borderlands 2 is to be aware of these subjects, however many in quantity. Roland is tied up in in a jail cell upon meeting him, famously foreshadowed by wall graffiti in the background screaming at the camera, You die! It's almost so heavy-handed that it wouldn't be considered upon first seeing it. I don't remember seeing that scene and going, oh, that must mean Roland dies. I love how the game introduces you to the Hyperion constructors here by showing Roland actually dismember one. It's a cool way of like tutorializing the fact that you can shoot the limbs off of these enemies that you'll see often throughout the game. Coming back to Sanctuary, Roland lets the Vault Hunters know that the key to everything that the Vault Hunters are trying to accomplish is being transported on a train by Hyperion. On that train is the Vault Key. In order to perform the heist, the Vault Hunters must enlist the help of Roland's friend. That friend is Mordecai, and just like every other returning Vault Hunter in this game, he has been made much more full of character and full of personality. He's also an alcoholic. You also meet Tiny Tina, one of the more divisive characters in the whole franchise. Uh, Look, she is voiced by Ashley Birch, Anthony's sister, a person of color. Tiny Tina has received many cries of racism and, I don't know, cultural insensitivity. I won't comment on this either way because I'm not of any race or culture that would or could have been offended. I I don't know. I think it's a bunch of silly baloney. So I really love the next part of this game because it's a super interesting look into video game writing and the hierarchies in which a video game falls through as it nears its completion. So essentially you find out that Wilhelm is protecting the vault key. Wilhelm, if you remember from the beginning of the game, is a practically unstoppable Hyperion cyborg, a horrific marriage of steel and skin designed for the purpose of search and destroy. Now here's what is really interesting about this boss fight. Well first, there's no intro cutscene despite him being mentioned as one of the most feared mercenaries in the galaxy and a horrific murderer of innocents. Second, he is easy, like stupid easy. Now this is never really explained away in the game. Roland and the Vault Hunters are shocked at how incredible of an accomplishment taking down Wilhelm is, and hopefully you, the player, are feeling the same thing. A player who has been playing close attention should either feel unsatisfied by the boss fight or otherwise feel extremely accomplished and powerful. Well, an unused echo recording, the audio logs in the game, has Handsome Jack explain that he poisoned Wilhelm prior to the fight with the Vault Hunters, weakening him so that it is 100% sure that the Vault Hunters defeat him and take the power core for, well, reasons we will discuss later. I think this is so interesting. Interesting in the ways in which this once existed in the writing, in voice acting, and within the game, yet didn't make it to the shipped game, for whatever reason. And interesting in the fact that Anthony Birch was somewhat of a creative champion for this game's story, and I am assuming that this must have been lost in the wealth of jobs he had, despite it being a pretty important and dissonant plot hole. When it's framed like this, it's incredible how this doesn't happen more often in video game development. There are so many moving parts, so many variables. 
Looking at the way in which a glitch in the dialogue has influenced a main character's sexuality, it's sort of a beautiful, medium-specific idiosyncrasy of video games as an art form that just kind of makes me smile. It's a wrinkle in a medium still being toyed with and experimented with, a sign of the medium's infancy. I love these kinds of things. I just, I just love it. So Jack poisoned Wilhelm because he wanted to make sure that the Vault Hunters got the power core, but not make it so obviously easy. The power core is what powers the shield to Sanctuary, disallowing Hyperion to shell it from space. So once you place the power core in the machine, it gives Angel direct control in which she shuts down the whole shield system, betraying you. Jack fires away at the town of Sanctuary and continues to do so murdering civilians. The thing about Sanctuary, however, is that it's a mining ship from Dahl. It is capable of digging into the earth, lifting off, flying to a new ore deposit, then lifting off again. The Vault Hunters and Scooter orchestrate this liftoff, to which Handsome Jack laughs. It's pretty slow moving, he will have no problem continuing to shell it. Our resident siren, Lilith, then takes matters into her own hands. Sorry kid, that was an accident. I'll see you on the other side though, I promise. Hit it, Scooter! <laughs> Man, this is one of them moments. Catch a ride! That's the best you got. A flying city? What did you jumps possibly have that makes you think you've got a chance against me? A siren. Sup. I love this whole sequence. I love the shelling and the sound design. I love the absurdity of all the citizens running around occasionally getting gibbed into red slush, accompanied by an over-to-the-top squish noise. I love the drama of the teleportation and the hesitant, truly unexpected, huh, that Handsome Jack gives. I hate the quest that comes after it, Bright Lights, Flying City, however, as it is pretty much just an odyssey through stalker-infested areas, annoying bosses, and slow-wave defense. People who play the game often know that this quest is a struggle. So upon arriving back at Sanctuary, now floating in the sky, you're able to run around as normal, except now you are floating in the sky. I love when games do this, allow you to get used to an area throughout the game. You know, you go there a lot, interact with it a lot, then return to it later in the game in a different context. Sanctuary is largely the same, but it's clear that it's floating in the air, and I think that's enough to keep the location interesting. Let me know other games that do this down below. I'm reminded of the Citadel in the first Mass Effect game in which you spend a lot of time there, but are returned for the final sequence to fight Saren. I think Ashley even mentions once near the beginning of the game, like, man, these staircases would be excellent cover in a firefight or something like that. I do wonder why Handsome Jack doesn't, you know, keep shooting at Sanctuary as it was flying over Overlook in Pandora. Lilith says something about it costing a lot of money for Hyperion and that as soon as it started, she would just teleport it again. But then why would they shoot so indiscriminately at the shields earlier in the game when the shield was up? Am I asking too much of this comedy action RPG here? I feel like I'm asking too much of it. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that Jack wouldn't just bomb the crap out of the floating city. After all of this, Roland and Lilith find out that Jack's motivation for finding the vault on Pandora is that it contains a super weapon, a supposed ancient alien called the Warrior, a powerful creature in which whoever releases it gets to control it. Jack intends to take control of this warrior, use it to liberate Pandora, and then be a benevolent ruler over all of the savages. It goes without saying that the Vault Hunters see this as an important thing to prevent. And I think this is really interesting and potentially poorly contextualized inside of the game given it could be one of the biggest character developments of the series. What I mean is that previously the Vault Hunters have been pretty self-motivated, especially the first game's Vault Hunters. They were always shooting for the loot inside of the vault, and while they would help people it would almost always be under the pretense of putting together the vault key. But here the Vault Hunters suddenly have a moral impetus to take down Handsome Jack and the Warrior. I guess it's a bit of self-preservation, but it is strange that they suddenly have a desire to protect the hellhole of Pandora, especially when a lot of them came from different planets. 
Angel talks to the Vault Hunters and tells them of a completely insane and potentially fatal plan to get to the Vault before Handsome Jack. In order to do so, the Vault Hunters must go through a disintegrator wall that only lets Hyperion machines through, then getting past a Hyperion super weapon, then a voice activated door that only works for Handsome Jack. In order to achieve all of this, the first step the Vault Hunters take is to go to the Hyperion Wildlife Preservation Plant, a place that Mordecai's friend slash pet Bloodwing has been taken by Hyperion. After plowing through the facility, the Vault Hunters are actually forced to fight Bloodwing and weaken it so that Morty can shoot it with a Trank Dart, allowing her to be captured. This fight is one of my favorites in the whole series. It's not awesome necessarily in its mechanics, its mechanics are pretty simple and non-engaging. What is interesting is the voice acting and the theme behind it. Essentially, Jack has been using slag experimentation with the bird. Jack has managed Bloodwing to take on multiple elements and become powerful using those elements. You fight the bird through multiple stages of elements, all the while Handsome Jack calls out each element over the radio. As you proceed through the fight, he mentions he just can't remember one of the elements, and says over and over that Bloodwing has another stage, but he can't remember. The brilliance of this whole sequence is that those who are new to Borderlands may not know what element he can't remember and be surprised as soon as Jack and Bloodwing remember the element. Players who are well-versed in the Borderlands universe would be internally screaming to themselves what that element Jack is forgetting, and be terrified of the ways in which that element would interact with Bloodwing. It's this dramatic irony that put, makes this sequence so awesome. I love it. Well, that element that Jack forgot was explosive. This won't hurt, I promise! This is, without a doubt, the turning point of the entire game, maybe the whole series up until this point. Now previously it had been a comedy action RPG, a rabid romp through Murderville, the story had always taken a backseat to the action. But here, after killing Bloodwing, here it becomes something different. The entire mood of the game shifts, the entire feelings towards Handsome Jack change. Previously he was funny, he was more charming and hilarious than evil or scary, and frankly most players wanted him to stick around because he has voice acted so well and written so cleverly. Players hadn't quite gotten to the point where they need to kill this man under any circumstances. But Bloodwing, Bloodwing. It's such a powerful moment, and it's unexpected. To this point, characters haven't been so mortal in Borderlands. Furthermore, the gameplay and writing intersect to create a nauseating dissonance, a dissonance that really emphasizes a hatred for Handsome Jack. To this point, the game has used humor to lighten the game and create absurd situations. But this time, Handsome Jack uses humor by accidentally forgetting the fifth element until the last second. For the player, this isn't funny, it's infuriating, it's a reversal of the elements we like about Borderlands. The game knows this is the shift too, because the rest of the game becomes a lot more dramatic from here on out. The stakes rise, the humor stays, but now it's always backhanded by a real motivation to carry out the Vault Hunter's goals. And those motivations, they must go on, unfortunately for Mordecai and his fans, myself included. The Vault Hunters still need to get to the Vault Key. To do this, the Vault Hunters go to Opportunity to get voice samples to create a convincing replication of Jack's voice, which, by the way, is a really cool addition to the game, because all of the ad-libs and one-liners that your character normally says in battle still happen, but instead with Jack's voice. I love that. It's things like this that put the game so high up on my list. Okay, I'm, I'm staying focused. The Vault Hunters also enlist the help of the final Vault Hunter, Brick. He is the leader of the Bandit Gang and is actually a really sensitive guy. I like that the game shifts Brick this way, especially after playing as him for a whole two playthroughs in the previous game. He's this loving guy now, he's deeply sympathetic, he is bloodthirsty still, but he doesn't make a lot of sense. He's the ultimate absurdity, the Borderlands experience reduced to a character, as bloodthirsty as he is wholesome. Now the Vault Hunters start the process to getting to the Vault Key, hidden away within Handsome Jack's bunker. They get Claptrap to disable the atomizer wall, climb up into the bunker, and suddenly realize that that bunker isn't a traditional bunker. It's a machine, a war machine, a giant industrial-sized Hyperion flying death fortress. 
This boss fight is good because it is one of the first main fights that completely forces the player to actually account for more things other than shooting down the health pool. There are multiple phases and objectives, and it has an appropriate amount of health with a diverse amount of attacks. Bunker can be annihilated in less than a second due to Vault Hunter Zero's skill, Bore, which dramatically increases damage upon going through multiple targets. It's interesting, Bunker is actually made up of multiple hitboxes, exponentially applying Bore once you shoot it, and taking him down in literally less than a second. It's really a sight to behold. You use the voice changer in order to access the chamber that holds the vault key. In that vault, you find a shocking revelation, something that previously we had not seen before. Angel is sitting in the room, chained up and being siphoned. Her siren energy is what is charging the vault key, and she has no say in the matter. She's a slave to her father. That father is Handsome Jack. And oh yeah, she's a siren. She asks the vault hunters to destroy her cage, which would ultimately kill her and free her from Jack's grasp. The vault hunters naturally do this. Roland enters, Lilith enters, Jack enters, and... She's dead. Jack just lost his only way to awaken the warrior. We got the vault key, but this isn't over yet. We gotta find Jack and take him out. Lilith, take the vault key to Tannis. I'm going after Jack. Roman! Son. You bastard! I'm gonna... Language? What's that saying? Don't pick a fight with a man with nothing left to lose. See, I'm gonna show you just how much you have to lose, and I got the most powerful siren on the planet to do it with. Lilith, kill the Vault Hunter. We've got a date to keep with the warrior. Do it, Lilith. No! So, Roland is dead. Again, evidence that the game is shifting towards a more dramatic tone. An enraged handsome Jack, drunk with anger at the loss of his daughter, shoots Roland and captures Lilith, using her instead to charge the vault key. The crew is bruised, battered, and broken. It's a dark time for the vault hunters, and handsome Jack apparently has the key and is headed towards the vault. The final third of the game here, I think, really slows down, and it isn't until the last push toward the warrior that the game resumes its steam. I've been thinking a lot about the amount of times I have played through the Borderlands 2 campaign, and looking at my characters on both the Xbox 360 and the PS PC, I've played through the game somewhere between 25 and 35 times. Every time I complete the Bunker and Angel quest, I always kind of groan because the game is a bit of a slog from here on out. And the trek towards the warrior isn't significantly better either. It's a pretty simple level design with waves of enemies and those walls that you can't get past until you defeat all the enemies. Ugh. The Vault Hunters head towards the vault and see Handsome Jack. He has beaten you there. Lilith is there charging the vault key. Jack screams to the sky, saying that the warrior has been awoken, and a giant lava rock monster emerges from the volcano with Jack in hand. There's a quick boss fight with Jack, which goes by easily, then a boss fight with the warrior itself. Now, of course, if you've been watching the video all the way through, which I have to ask why, then you would know just how much Borderlands 1's final boss was such a tremendous failure. The warrior, when compared to the destroyer, looks like a Dark Souls level complexity boss encounter. But when you compare the warrior fight to almost anything else in video games, it's pretty uninspired. Bullet sponge with weak areas, goes into the ground and comes up, has a couple AoE attacks and occasionally the lava rises, which could have introduced some platforming, which I think Borderlands is actually really underrated in, but it hardly changes anything about the combat arena. The lava is barely a threat, but you would never suspect it from Lilith's screaming. After the fight, Jack is wounded and bruised. The warrior is broken and destroyed by a space-born moonshot. The player has the opportunity to either let Lilith kill Jack, or you can shoot him yourself. I've spent some time thinking about this as a choice in the game, because the game doesn't really give you many choices like this, but I think I'm overthinking it. I'm not sure I've seen anything like this. It's a cool touch if you're really invested in the story, in Roland, or in their relationship, because letting Lilith kill Jack may yield some more catharsis than just blasting a wounded Jack yourself. Then the game ends with the vault key exploding open and revealing a map of the galaxy, with vault symbols all over the galaxy. 
Lilith mentions something about saying that there's no rest for the wicked, implying that they have continued vault hunting to do, and putting a cap on the whole idea of heroics in the game being a little up for interpretation. And I guess that's the whole moral point of the game, is it not? That true heroes, when confronted with the choice of doing something right, something sacrificial, something more than just what is important to them, when the Vault Hunters found out that the Vault was not a Vault of immeasurable wealth and instead was a warrior controllable by Handsome Jack, the Vault Hunters don't choose to ignore that fact and move on. They choose to pursue the warrior for themselves to either take down Hyperion or take down the warrior. They could have stopped. They could have left Pandora to be taken over by the clearly stronger Hyperion. And I mentioned earlier that this wasn't a story about superheroes, and it wasn't a story about teachers or firefighters. Borderlands 2 is a story of people who originally had no business being heroes, but found a moral dilemma and landed on the right side of it. That moment when they find out about the warrior is when the Vault Hunters become hero. Borderlands 2 is a game that embraces the fact that it is a video game far more than the previous game does. And I love this game because of its gameplay. Sure, I love the world building and characters and art and everything we just talked about, but what has kept me playing the game for hundreds upon hundreds of hours is the fact that it provides me with a consistent product that has an addictive and masterable gameplay loop. The main pull of the game for me is the way that it handles loot. I love how this game does loot, and the most interesting part to me is that the bosses are tied to certain legendaries. So for example, a world boss called Savage Lee is just a normal name boss existing in the universe. Upon killing him, he has a small chance to drop a legendary pistol called the Unkempt Herald. Killing Doc Mercy, another name boss, might yield you the Infinity Pistol. Midgemong, the Kerblaster, Boom Boom, the bonus package grenade, and so on and so forth. There is so much replay value here in the game through legendary farming, and the act of farming goes without a hitch as well. It's the perfect storm of accessibility, memorization, RNG, and collection. I love spending mindless time just plugging away at certain bosses, trying to get the weapon I want. And even if the weapon you want drops, it might not be the version you want. If you remember the way the loot works in the previous game, you will find out that Borderlands 2 does it a little differently. Instead of just barrel 1, barrel 2, each part of the weapon belongs to a manufacturer now. So a gun might have a Torg barrel with a Vladoff grip. This can happen even when the gun is a Vladoff gun because the different weapon manufacturers mean a lot more in this game than they did in the first. So in the first game, the manufacturer didn't really change the way the guns operate, just instead gave them flat stat increases. But in Borderlands 2, the guns radically change depending on the manufacturer. For example, a Torg weapon only shoots explosives now. Vladoff weaponry all shares a consistent aesthetic and militaristic fire rate. Doll weaponry fires and bursts when aimed down sight. Jacob's is never elemental. Bandit weapons always have enormous magazine sizes. Add on to this that all of the manufacturers have their own specific aesthetic and look to them, and the world becomes even more rooted in capitalism once we start introducing brand loyalty. Now really, you are beholden to the production of these weapons because you might need a Torg weapon to take out a certain boss. Or you might just prefer one weapon where your friend prefers another. People have raised a stink about the new Borderlands game's approach to loot, and I have to say I just don't understand that. I understand the issue with a decrease in world drop chance. I do believe that the boss tied legendary drops does not have to come at the expense of legendary world drops, however, and this is evidenced in Borderlands the pre-sequel, who I thought got the loot system almost perfectly. And as far as the guns go, there's infinitely more variety in the way the guns operate and work and look than there is in the first game. It finally feels like there are actually hundreds of weapons, not just 20 or so guns colored differently. That being said, the balance is maybe worse in this game as a result of that unique weaponry. For example, there are some items that when paired together because of their unique characteristics are so much infinitely better than any other combination you can get in the game that you are actually handicapping yourself by not using them. Uh, a Salvador, a Gunzerker, one of the classes, with a double penetrating unkempt herald in one hand and a grog nozzle in the other, is such an unstoppable force of damage and healing that he becomes the clear number one choice when it comes to class builds. Come to think about it, if you are really in the interest of moving through the game as quickly and efficiently as possible, and as destructive as possible, there's really no other option than Salvador, especially in the third playthrough offered, Ultimate Vault Hunter mode. 
In normal mode, or the first playthrough, almost everyone is pretty darn lethal if you know how to keep your weapons updated and know what guns work for whom. There's a lot of problematic issues that arise in the game as you get higher and higher in level. One of the best parts of the first Borderlands game is the fact that if you get a good roll on, say, a level 50 double anarchy, it can last you from level 50 to 63, for example. In Borderlands 2, however, even some of the best weapons in the game would not last you 13 levels at that level. During the OP levels, an OP6 gun just won't cut it most of the time in OP8. That's a two-level difference. The level of scaling as you reach the end of the third playthrough is just absurd, causing you to practically have to do a complete makeover of your inventory every couple of levels. And look, I get that might be the point of the higher playthroughs, but I'm also aware that it just isn't fun, and it isn't logically consistent within the basic foundational design philosophies behind Borderlands to begin with. Those philosophies really center around the very top of those darn item cards, the level of the item. Without that number, the core of the Borderlands experience begins to dissipate, at least insofar that the player would have no reason at that point to start trying out other weapons. The item level exists so that guns become unviable over time, causing you to pick up new weapons and try things out. The issue with this in the later levels is that there are literally only a handful of weapons that you can realistically use, at least realistically use and also have a fun time playing the game. A lot of types of weapons, such as Bandit or pretty much all assault rifles, actually can't out-DPS the healing of the enemies you are shooting at in the Ultimate Vault Hunter mode. The B-Shield is another problematic item that I think the Borderlands developers realized is problematic just weeks after the launch of the game. What the B-Shield does is when your shield is full, it adds a tremendous amount of damage to each shot. Now originally it used to add that damage in full to each pellet, so when you shot a shotgun that damage got applied to each pellet of the shot. Now it's just each pull of the trigger, but still it's a large amount of extra damage that when applied to a boss makes fights significantly shorter. Finally, there's the problem of the element slag in this game. Slag takes whatever damage you are doing and multiplies it depending on the playthrough. If the second and third playthrough, and the third especially, slag becomes such an important crush that in some of the higher levels like OP levels, which is where the enemies scale to levels higher than your own, the damage that you are doing to enemies without slag is actually not enough to out damage their healing. It's an absolute necessity. And I'm not sure I like that, especially when you consider the fact that only one character has two hands for two guns, meaning that for everyone else, you have to switch back and forth between a slag weapon and a damage dealing weapon, which can get tedious and unfun. The game is markedly approved upon compared to the first one in many different ways. You can now move in the fight for re your life state, the skill trees are more diverse and active, there still isn't a buy full ammo option at the vending machines, which I think Marcus would be, you know, interested in. There are much more diverse enemies with more mechanics. The bosses are still bullet sponges, but there are more named enemies in the game and more creative me mechanics behind them. The game uses the fact that it is a game extremely well as well. We already talked about how creative the Bloodwing fight was in this regard, but also like little challenges and idiosyncrasies like the fact that the loaders can be radically changed by their dismemberment. Or the mission where you have to wound a number of those loaders before the maintenance workers come out, opening a way into the Hyperion plant. I love when the game acknowledges it's a game as well, as there are plenty of fourth wall breaks throughout the story. How about when Sir Hammerlock is trying to write a new almanac? You have to go through and change the names of the bully mongs, ending with silly results. It actually shows up when you aim at them. Or when you go through this whole long dramatic quest about how this cursed gun has driven people to suicide, only, see that it, only to see that it just won't shut up and can't even be muted when you turn down the master volume in the settings. I love seeing Mordecai shoot down from the mountain, destroying badass loaders with one shot while screaming. Running through that trying to participate, but seeing Morty destroy everything is a really cool moment in the game. There's absolutely something alluring about the extensibility of this game, of its abilities to stretch its legs and go on and on and on in the best way possible. There's this incredible YouTube and Twitch community for the Borderlands series, with a lot of the main influencers in the space achieving far over thousands and thousands of hours in the game. I myself have hundreds of hours into the series, maybe thousands if you include my time playing on consoles when the game first came out. 
The rhythms of the combat, the addiction of the weapon drops, the diversity and discovery of builds that work in the higher levels, the routine, monotonous, somehow absolutely meditative, back and forth between running to a boss, killing that boss, looking for his assigned legendary drop, not getting it, save quitting the game, reloading and repeating until that boss drops the specific weapon that you desire. It's just this bizarre, medium-specific treat that keeps on giving. I am yet to have a single-player game that itches this specific replayability scratch. And it's funny because neither the first game nor the pre-sequel would ever reach the heights of replayability that Borderlands 2 achieves. The first because of the ways the legendary weapons work, and the pre-sequel because of the fact that bosses do have specific legendaries, but they don't respawn after killing them in their mission. The farming element of these named enemies is the key to the game's replayability. The DLC offering for Borderlands 2 is unbelievable, and maybe the most robust for any game that I have ever seen or played, and this is not at all hyperbole. The four main DLC offerings, plus a host of holiday-themed headhunter packs, give almost, and I am not joking, an entire other video game to play. I've never seen anything like it. My rankings of the DLC probably go like this, because I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about them. My least favorite being Sir Hammerlock's Big Game Hunt, only because of the repetitive mission structure and lack of interest in characters. Third on my list is Mr. Torg's Campaign of Carnage, only because I find Mr. Torg, and this might make a lot of people angry, uh, a little grating and annoying on the ears. My second favorite DLC in the game is Captain Scarlet's Pirate Booty, really because I think Captain Scarlet is a great character, and I truly think that this DLC really gets the point of DLC, insofar that it doesn't bog itself down with the heavy thematic or moral issues of the vanilla game and exists as an opportunity for the developers to have some fun with their own engine and game and tell a story that they want to tell. My favorite, and I believe this is as close to unanimous as you can get with something subjective, is Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep, a heartwarming, beautiful, hilarious take on the marriage between the FPS ARPG and Dungeons and Dragons. I believe this DLC is transcendent, an incredible use of the medium, and almost in a flawless use of the model of DLC, or expansion content in general. This DLC is incredible and actually contributes to the story and our understanding of characters like Tiny Tina. I just love it. If you've ever played Borderlands 2 and have not played Dragon Keep, change that. It does some incredibly clever things with Tina being the bunker master of the game, and her changing up the world with her imagination as you play through it. It's just... It's phenomenal. And overall, Borderlands 2, for me, is just one of those games. I never have claimed to be an objective video game critic. I'm often heard saying that I don't know much, and that these are my ideas and my analysis, not my critique of a game. Most of my videos are celebrations of games as opposed to meaningful dismantlings of games. It's what I think I did wrong with my Mass Effect and Horizon videos. So much could have been improved in those videos, and I tried hard to be a critic. This time, I'm okay with saying that Borderlands 2 is just that game for me. That game that you turn to when you don't know what to play. That game you spend all night playing with your friends, with people you've never met. That game you become a contributing member to some online forum about. That game that let you go far away for a bit in a tough time. At times, I think there's this gut reaction against escapism as a concept, that any time that is spent meaningfully should directly interact or contribute to you or others' betterment. Time is this finite resource. Why squander it escaping to Pandora? Because whether it was Halo, Call of Duty, Rapture, or the Citadel, video games aren't just escapism. They're opportunities for you to express yourself through a different medium. It might be really good at Counter-Strike or grinding matchmaking on Halo 3, but sometimes there's just that game that helps you in just the right moment. That game has always been Borderlands 2 for me. 2K Australia and Telltale Games both took pretty significant cracks at making a Borderlands title. The first, a traditional looter shooter title, Borderlands the Pre-Sequel, used the same engine, same assets practically, and almost the same amount of guns as the second game. Playing through the pre-sequel actually yields, in my opinion, one of the best stories told in all of the Borderlands games. The majority of the game is a prequel, where the bread of the sandwich, or I guess the start and the ending, take place after Borderlands 2. That's why it's called the pre-sequel, even the title is a joke. 
The issue with both of these games, however, is not pre-sequels poor critical reception or Tales from the Borderlands low consumer sales. The issue is Handsome Jack. You see, in Borderlands 2, Handsome Jack was as close to as perfect for the series as you could get for a villain. He embraced the humor, exuded the darkness of the game's subtext, was a crony capitalist as well written as he was voice acted, and met the criteria for being a compelling villain, all the while being a formidable villain. And Gearbox realized this, of course, or 2K, the publisher, I guess I'm unsure. Regardless, they knew that they struck gold with Handsome Jack and particularly his voice actor, Damon Clark. Handsome Jack was lightning in a bottle for Gearbox, and they wanted to capture it again and again. Pre-sequel is essentially a tragic hero's tale, which if you don't remember from you when you read the Odyssey in like ninth grade, I will try to condense it to a couple of seconds. The hero rules something, makes a lot of money, is awesome, whatever. Ultimately, they reach the apex of their dominance and will almost always make some crucial error in judgment. This is, of course, the fatal flaw of our tragic hero, that hubris, this prideful reluctance to accept other people's judgment, always leads to the hero's fall. Now, usually the person giving the advice comes in the form of some kind of sage or prophet. In this case, Jack is our tragic hero. His rise through the ranks of Hyperion is his ascent, his path towards greatness, his finding of Iridium, his taking over the Hyperion Corporation near the end. The issue with this, of course, is that it all comes as a result of his sanity, of his ability to sympathize or empathize, of his ability to see anything past the scope of his own desire. And that prophet I mentioned earlier, it's interesting. This prophet actually comes in the form of Moxie. Moxie, who Jack is just completely enamored with. She is the one who betrays Jack. She is the one who recognizes Jack's fall, and she is the one who organizes the original Vault Hunters to do away with him before he can reach ultimate power. So why did this game fail, then? Why did it not receive the sort of critical success that Borderlands 2 did, if I'm speaking highly about the contents of its story? I, I think there's a couple of reasons for this, and it stems completely from the development of the game and the circumstances surrounding the developers and publishers. 2K knew that another Borderlands game must be made. Borderlands 2 made heaps of cash. What the developers also realized around this time is how successful and unique the DLC approach to Borderlands 2 was. And thus, Borderlands the pre-sequel is absolutely a bloated DLC to Borderlands 2. The content just isn't there, and you can almost tell. I'm unsure if this has been confirmed that the game was supposed to be DLC, but near the end of production, I think it was decided that the pre-sequel was intended to be sold as a separate game. The level design suggests this for sure, because of its ability to stretch out quests to almost triple the length of time it would take in most other games. Quests in this game are heavily bloated, they're disrespectful of your time, unimaginative at least most of the time, and the new movement mechanics in the game encourage moving to be extremely slow and floaty, sometimes too difficult to control. Now, those who have played this game know how many frustrating and unnecessary deaths that the new movement mechanics cause. A lot of this pre-sequel is respawning, floating through the moon, running from objective to objective, and dying again. Add on to that that there are rarely, if at all, new legendaries, and most of them are just reskins or re-elements of previous guns from Borderlands 2. I like the new laser weapons, I like the new Vault Hunters, I'm not so sure I love Elpis, the moon, and the location of the game. And you see, that's the thing. Despite all of this, I still kinda like Borderlands TPS as a piece of storytelling, and I still respect and acknowledge its importance in the Borderlands universe. So one thing I didn't really get to mention in the video is basically the ways in which the game's social commentary or um, political commentary or liberal agenda actually probably influenced a lot of people's opinions on the game. So for example, on Elpis, um, you know, the, the binaries of gay and straight, they don't really exist so much on Elpis as much as um, everyone just is sort of floating somewhere in between. And the characters are very vocal about their sexuality and gender and other social commentaries. And I think as we know about gamers, this doesn't always go well with people. The, the authorial uh, intent of the game is very clear, and I think that probably bothered a lot of people. I don't know how I feel about this necessarily, because they absolutely raise the bar in terms of this kind of thing in the pre-sequel, uh, but I think this probably explains a lot of why um, people weren't exactly as happy with this game as they were Borderlands 2. There's so much to like about this game, such as in the characterization of the characters. 
For example, it's insane how in the Borderlands games, there are few and far between any sort of character arcs, at least in the way we see them in movies and television. In the Borderlands, most of the characters are just hyperbolic caricatures or stereotypes, and that is an endearing aspect of the game. I like this about the game. The opportunity the pre-sequel has by being a quasi-spinoff is it has time to give those characters arcs, and that it allows them to become more than just caricatures and trend closer towards characters. We obviously see this through Jack and his journey, but we also see characters like Moxie show that they have an interesting double life to themselves, and the ways in which she tries to hide her true engineer garage junkie self from others. As a side note, I always thought this addition to Moxie's character was kind of, I don't know, odd. It rubs me the wrong way a bit, I'll just say that. Not enough to raise a horrible stink about it, but enough to maybe run it by some of you guys. Now, I don't love that the writers at 2K Australia felt that they needed to give Moxie that secret side. I loved Moxie because she didn't have that other side, because her image wasn't a fabrication. It was her authentic self, and she projected it unapologetically. The thought that she is actually a nerd, or actually something that isn't her sexy, bombastic self, makes me wonder what 2K Australia's writers were saying about exactly that sort of promiscuous presentation. I don't think it is bad that Moxie has that side to her. I don't even think it is bad that she has both. I think it's unlike her to have that hobby and not be open about it, given that her confidence and prowess is such a special part of her character. It's like that weird cliche in movies and TV where the hot girl plays Call of Duty or knows a lot about cars. It's this weird desire for writers to make girls have more traditionally masculine traits, whereas they could just be feminine, and that's that. There's one of those things where it's like, I guess, you know, I'm not a woman or an accomplished inventor in my garage. So if you are a woman or an accomplished inventor, tell me how this whole character development makes you feel. I hate to see Moxie be reduced to having her image be a cover-up for a traditionally male image. I would love to hear from someone on this one. If anybody at Gearbox or 2K watches this, which, you know, probably not, but if you did, the Twitter is down below. The other character that certainly gets her own arc here is Lilith, the character that most people either liked or felt indifferent about upon playing the original two games. In this game, Lilith becomes something of a villain, of an anomaly against the rest of the protagonist-type characters in the game who are supporting the resistance against Hyperion. And you see, I think that's what Borderlands the pre-sequel does best. It suddenly makes it incredibly clear that at some point, every character in the Borderlands game thinks that they are doing the right thing. Commandant Steele certainly did. Handsome Jack, as you learn through the events of the pre-sequel in the second game, thinks that he is liberating Pandora by harnessing the warrior. And finally, Lilith believes that she is doing the right thing by recklessly following Jack into the Iridium portal and attempting to execute Athena. We have learned in our own previous readings that most everyone in the Borderlands universe are incredibly selfish. But what the pre-sequel makes clear is that the people being selfish, they don't exactly see it that way all the time. They think they are doing the right, appropriate, or even moral thing. Add on to that that the Judeo-Christian implications of a name like Lilith, who was a seductress red-headed woman closely tied to demons and elemental witchcraft, and it isn't that difficult to see how Gearbox might be posturing Lilith as a reckless villain, or at least a moral impediment in the next Borderlands titles. Of course, the real star of the show is Jack, and Jack's descent into madness throughout the entire game. And even though I criticize the writers for beating the metaphorical dead butt stallion of Handsome Jack, he continues to have a magnificent performance here in this game. I like how the game is a little on the nose with his development as a psychopath. Now, I don't like it because it's on the nose. I like it because it fits within the core of the Borderlands writing. It's self-referential and well brazen and forceful. For for example, I love how in the beginning of the pre-sequel, Like when you first meet Jack, he's lamenting the fact that the Lost Legion have come to the moon base and started shooting people. He yells to the player, what are these maniacs even doing? We don't even have a real military up here. They're just murdering workers. It's a heavy-handed yet effective way to show where he was versus where we know he is to be because we played the second game. I remember the times in Borderlands 2 when he is laughing about shooting up entire towns of defenseless peasants and being reminded of how someone was rushing him with a spoon in self-defense and laughs about it. So the game comes to a final head with Jack, Lilith, and whatever Vault Hunter you are taking on the Iridian Guardian in a pretty good boss fight. At least I like this fight. It has two phases and while it can be trivially easy, it can get a little difficult on the second playthrough. Lilith enters, punches Jack in a cool shot, and basically caps off the Jack origin story here. 
It's an interesting ending, one that gives reason for Jack's anger and psychopathy in the second game that might not have been properly contextualized. The path pretty much acts as a three-point descent. So Jack was a driven Hyperion employee who spotted out the Iridian on Pandora before anyone else and saw an opportunity. He enlists the help of the pre-sequel Vault Hunters as well as Lilith, Roland, and Moxie. At one point in the game, Jack actually shoots a bunch of probably innocent people outside of his spaceship because he knew one of them was betraying the group. So he airlocks them all. Moxie recognizes this kind of action and is the final straw of Jack's descent into madness and orchestrates a betrayal. This betrayal is what ultimately breaks Handsome Jack, and Lilith's annihilating of Jack's mug is what gives him the personal desire to personally destroy those vault hunters in the second game. <sighs> and that's really that. That's the pre-sequel. It's a game that looks to contextualize why Handsome Jack is the way that he is in the second game. As far as the actual gameplay itself, it's interesting. The game takes place on the moon, and a good third of the game takes place in a space station. And despite these new locations, despite the new movement mechanics, a lot of the re enemies are reskins of assets from the second game. The weapons are certainly reskins, despite the newly added laser class of weapons, which are really strong. I kind of hope they stick around in the new Borderlands titles. I like those guns. They also do a good job with addressing the reliance on slag in this game by adding a new element called cryo, which adds a freezing and slowing effect and a small debuff onto the enemy, but not so much that it becomes an absolute crutch to kill anything. This allows the developers to balance the game around the enemies not being debuffed all the time, which I enjoyed immensely from my playing of the second game. Pre-sequel also adds in a lot more flavor dialogue from the Vault Hunters themselves in an obvious attempt to give the player more character as opposed to just seeing the actions play out in front of you. Everybody good? Nice to meet ya. I'm Janie Springs, junk dealer. Who are you? The name's Jack, babe. Well, nice to meet you, Jack. I like that a lot of the discussions with NPCs will play out a bit differently depending on who you are playing as. That didn't really happen in the first two games. I appreciate the attempt, it isn't great in this game, but I like the trajectory of the idea of the next couple of games. As a piece of software, as a video game, I feel pretty ambivalent about the pre-sequel. So many of the quests prolong the game in such unnatural and unfun ways, it's clear that the game was meant as a DLC and rushed into becoming a real game. But you know what? I think it is a good value for what you can get it for today. And I support buying it if you are invested in the series. This goes for the Claptrap DLC as well, which is honestly one of the best DLCs in all of Borderlands. I think the main story of the game paces itself well and tells an interesting cautionary tale of the promise of absolute power corrupting absolutely. Telltale Games also took a shot at producing a canonical Borderlands game in their own Borderlands way. Okay, I'm just going to go out there and say it. I do not like Telltale Games. I almost can't stand them. Honestly, I'm not sure that I can stand them. I played through the Tales from the Borderlands Telltale series when it came out, as it came out, and I remember thinking they were about 10 minutes of interesting writing, zero minutes of fun gameplay, and every other minute was wasting my time. In an effort to stay true to myself and my channel, I won't be talking much at all about these games. If you know how you feel about the Telltale formula, play these games. Now, I have played all of the Tales episodes and can say that it's alright, at least compared to the only other Telltale series I have completed, which was the first season of The Walking Dead. It's a tale that continues starring Handsome Jack, as well as some interesting developments of characters like Athena, Scooter, and Janie Springs. Okay, maybe I dislike this entry because of Scooter's character development in the game. I'm unsure. My main issue with Tales from the Borderlands as a member of the Borderlands canon and as a video game is that it ignores the integral aspects of the Borderlands gameplay experience that actually helps contribute and emphasize the wider themes of the whole series. That was a bit of a mouthful. I feel like a broken record, but the Siren's Call of Loot and something new that we've talked about so much in this video. That is the core of the experience. If you take out the gameplay of the Borderlands experience, all you have is self-referential, sometimes witty, usually cringy writing. You can get a better version of practically anywhere on Netflix. Without the gameplay to help lift up what makes the story great, Borderlands would just be a kind of mediocre comedy. And I hope you guys understand me, this channel is a hobby, a hobby where I review video games, and unfortunately I do not see Tales from the Borderlands as a video game. 
I do not have the time or the patience to put so much work into something I don't enjoy. Tails is important to the canon of the Borderlands universe, and important to a huge fan's understanding of that universe. I do not believe that it contributes enough to the theme or overarching rhetoric of the series to warrant me swallowing my pride in writing and editing about a game I have nothing to say about. And I can't help but feel like that was sort of a negative end to my largest video project yet. But regardless, if you've made it this far into the video, please let me know down below. It would honestly blow my mind if you had made it this far. Thank you so much for watching, truthfully. At the end of these videos, I like to give sort of a channel update. I've not uploaded a video in like half a year. In that time, I've graduated college, taught high school, and I'm in the process of moving states away and am starting my career. I'm frankly terrified of the future and what it holds. This channel is one of the more stable things in my future right now, so it, it is important to me, but you guys must know that it is not the most important thing for me right now. These videos take a long time, but they don't take six months long. My life is changing rapidly, and some things are falling to the wayside. I hope this channel doesn't have to be one of them. Because I really love doing this, and I kind of feel like I sort of suck at it, but like, who cares? This isn't my job. If I suck at my job, that's one thing, right? But I make no money from this. There's no obligation here, and I have fun doing it. So many times throughout editing this video, I thought, man, this isn't perfect, or like, ah, oh, I'm so sick of my voice. Should I redo that part? And I just can't really afford to do that anymore. Either no videos or imperfect videos at this point. These videos are authentically me and my ideas, and I'm so happy to be able to say that. As far as the future, I usually have a list of analyses I want to do next that I talk to you guys about. Not really anymore. I will share some ideas. Turn the videos off if you don't want any David O.Z. spoilers, though. I've always wanted to write about the Assassin's Creed games, not because I love them or think that they're good games, but because I think they're interesting and there's a lot to talk about there. I've written a lot on the first one right now. Um, it's in my notes. It's in my Google Docs. I have enough to be able to start a video on it. I am tempted to do a series analysis over The Witcher, kind of like this one, but that would probably take months again. There's maybe Kingdom Hearts, Red Dead Redemption, I'm probably going to do that one. Maybe an RPG like Pillars of Eternity or Divinity. I don't know. Who knows? Let me know in the comments. Your opinion really does matter to me. I have been doing some Twitch streaming on a new account. Some of you guys have been there. Hello, if you're watching this. It's linked down below. Please come by and talk to me about the channel or your life or video games or anything else really. Thank you for almost 1,000 subscribers. That number kind of blows my noggin. I actually have done YouTube for about six years now. Not this YouTube channel, of course, but I've had many different channels. I've had all these different creative outlets. I sort of did, um, like six years ago, I had like a Call of Duty commentary channel. And, um, and then after that, I'm pretty sure I tried like the daily vlogging thing. And then I tried something else somewhere along the way. And um, I've been... I've uploaded probably over 250 to 300 YouTube videos in the last six years across all these different channels. And, and not one of those channels has ever reached 1,000 subscribers. To think that this one, the one that I made kind of as a known personal thing, um, you know, I wasn't really trying to get popular with this, is the doing the best that I've ever had. That's kind of cool. So thank you. It blows my mind that I have this opportunity to make two-hour videos about video games and people watch them and like them. Thank you. Come by the Twitch stream. I'll see you around.